So um, to, kick, to kick things off, welcome. Calling the meeting to order. And the first order of business is to approve the minutes from the May 9th meeting. Um, so I'll give commissioners a moment to take a peek at those and uh, then we'll take a motion. I, I reviewed them and I motion to accept the minutes. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Great, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so the next item of business is um, announcements. So we'll start off with Shelly. And I just wanna, can I make a comment actually before you go, which is to say that um, I know you're gonna talk about this, but as someone who participated in some of the Play Like a Girl events, I was very impressed with the amazing things that um, happened all in a short span of time. So as always, your staff does a beautiful job. And I also just wanna comment, I know I said this to you as well, but um, the sprinkler pop-up event was <laughs> so well attended and so fun. I just went past and I could not believe like what I was seeing. So love that, appreciated that, yeah. um, that yeah. break from the heat. And I know a lot of our community members did as well. Thank you for saying that. Uh, yeah, the pop-up sprinkler, we uh, we advertised it, I think, at 10.30 p.m. on Monday night, and we um, it was, it was going to be 30 minutes of sprinkler time at Memorial Park. We had like 400 people there, oh, wow. and we gave out oh, wow. beach balls and popsicles and water bottles and, sunglasses. and sunglasses. That's awesome. There were adults and kids running through those sprinklers, so it was really fun. That's hilarious. Um, and uh, my staff, Eva, Phelan, and Leem, and the whole crew who put on all the Play Like a Girl events were great. We had um, 250 people attend the movie, the sporty shorts, and then we had 400 girls who actually registered um, their scorecards and about 1,000 people in the park that day. So it was a lot of fun. Great, great stuff for girls. Yeah, yeah, yeah for girls. So. And what, this is like the third year? The second, the second year. year. That's yeah, awesome. That's it's amazing. really great. Yeah. Um, not as exciting as the Memorial Park bathrooms update, but they're supposed to be done the 21st, so fingers crossed, but I might say the end of June. Um, I will let you know as soon as they are, um, and hopefully, I don't know if you do a ribbon cutting for bathrooms, but. Um, <laughs> well, we might cut. We uh, can talk about that. Paper yeah, <laughs> toilet paper cutting. <laughs> uh, and I'm gonna let uh, Commissioner Cooper uh, talk about an event we have coming up on the 22nd. Okay, I'm excited to announce what I think may be Albany's first Juneteenth celebration. And that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. Juneteenth is a uh, commemoration, well, first of all, it's about the Emancipation Proclamation through Abraham Lincoln, and that was in uh, 1863, declaring all slaves to be free. The reason this one has a lot of uh, emphasis and it's really exciting is because uh, unbeknownst to a lot of people, our president signed, our president signed uh, an executive order called H.R. 1242, which is commemorating the arrival, unwillingly, the first arrival of the Afri African American slave in Point Comfort, Virginia in 1619. So this particular one has some significance. So uh, more exciting about this one is that our guest speaker is an Albanian, mm -hmm. Mr. Howard Moore Jr., who was a key uh, figure in the civil rights movement in the 60s. He will be speaking. He's 84 years old. He lives here in Albany. He mm -hmm. wants to see that dog happen at Memorial <laughs> <laughs> And uh, he's a wealth of information. He's a walking encyclopedia. And hopefully Mr. Bob Brower will be there as well. He was Ron Dellum's chief of staff and a mentor to Barbara Lee, who's our congresswoman. Uh, he's a little under the weather, but I'm hoping he'll be there and they'll be taking questions. And the goal is to further the information education of the uh, input of the African American during the 400 years. So I hope you can be there. Fantastic, thank you so much for your leadership there. Mm -hmm. That'll be at the Senior Center on the 22nd from 6 to 8. And you didn't say anything about you, fabulous moderating of this discussion on that evening, too. Mark and Rec, I wanted to... I had a couple announcements, if Great. I Great, absolutely. Uh, first off, just this afternoon, I received this email. East Bay Regional Park has a public survey. They're asking... Uh, Folks to, uh, it says it's a short survey, which I've seen things described as short survey that took a good half hour to fill out, so I'm not sure what that means. But eastbayparksurvey.com, they're looking for feedback on their, celebrating their 80th anniversary, looking for feedback. So eastbayparksurvey, eastbayparksurvey.com. And I also wanted to mention my little badge here. I'm participating in the Avenue Adventure. This is a, uh, a game, a, a, a live puzzle game put on by, uh, uh, Dubois, the Albany Haunts guy whose name I'm forgetting, but uh, maybe you saw uh, last week some crazy signs up on the poles around
downtown Solano. And yes, Pablo. I did. Yes. I was wondering. Well, that's for this game, and it's all part of the it's all part of the story. You get enmeshed in this story, and you it takes you around town and solving solving puzzles. So, uh, if you want to get started, uh, you can still sign up and through the twentieth. Go to up online. You give them your cell number, and and they can also get started. There. And yeah, it's okay. So the first item that we have on the agenda is the Lower Cornices okay. Creek Restoration Project phase. Just want to make sure you know public comment. Oh, yes, I apologize. We have a general public comment um, session at the beginning for any comments related to things not on the agenda. So if anybody here would like to make a general public comment related to nothing that's later on the agenda, this would be a great time to come on up to the podium. Thank you for that. <clears throat> This is about Coda Deces Creek. It is not about the agenda item. Okay. I'm Susan Schwartz. I'm the head of Friends of Five Creeks, 24-year-old, all-volunteer Creek and Watershed Restoration Group founded here in Albany. We appreciate this opportunity because we're here for the path to summarize um, what's happened this, this spring on Coda Deces Creek between San Pablo and the railroad tracks. I'm not going to read about our depressing ongoing efforts after the April 3rd fish kill, except that tomorrow morning we'll be surveying for bugs uh, to try to determine whether they were affected. We're hoping they weren't. In terms of maintenance, in our GPS mapping, uh, now public on the CalFlora database, has given us a very good understanding of the rather exciting variety of natives that are growing and in some cases spreading along the creek, but also the huge back of, backlog of work after years of neglect. We've had six major work parties and several smaller weed warrior sessions. They have definitely made a dent. Um, we have two work parties set for late July, probably one in August. But we've had to take on more responsibility between 8th and 9th. We were shocked at the overgrowth uh, on the North Albany side between 8th and 6th. It was an area set aside for habitat, and instead it was just abandoned. Um, and then below six, the bindweed, that stuff that looks like white morning glory, is just so overwhelming that we volunteers are basically writing that off, except for one small area where we hope to be able to welcome families and people from the teams to enjoy the creek. In terms of what the three responsible agencies, Albany, Berkeley, and UC Berkeley, are doing, maintenance regarding trash and camps has improved since we found the $450,000 that they had forgotten for years. Unfortunately, they have not yet come up with what we see as anything like a realistic maintenance plan. And in our view, by not recognizing what needs to be done, they're just leaving everything to us. Now, from the point of view of good government, that money re remains, for now, essentially a slush fund with closed meetings, no public input, no usable financial reporting, and no accountability. There is no clear way for citizens to ask for information, volunteer, or report problems. Now, this is not necessarily Albany's fault, and we hope it will all get better. But Cordonesis Creek is a complex challenge for which you commissioners apparently are going to be the go-to public body. I hope that sometime this summer, when you have a little time, you will accept our invitation, take a creek walk with us. Please get in touch. Our contact information is on that sheet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Can I can I ask a, when the meeting at, with um, City of Berkeley and the Fish and Wildlife Service is? Uh, uh, yes, uh, it is. Can I, can you go to the microphone? Friday, June twenty fifth at one thirty in City Hall, and our email Council Member Kishawami's aide today has suggested that she invite someone from the City of Albany. If you are interested, I can just somebody email me and I'll give you the contact information. I'll, I'll email you and you. share it. Thank you. Any other public comments that are general and not related to our agenda items? Okay. That moves us to a very closely related item, which is the Lower Cordonesis Creek Restoration Project Phase 4, 8th Street to 10th Street. And we have a presentation. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Jeff Bond. I'm the Community Development Director. I'm going to give you just a very brief uh, introduction and, and background and then turn it over to our consultants, um, Annika Swinehart and Rich Joaquin, to help walk you through the progress that we've made and answer your questions. Um, to refresh your memory, we were last here in January presenting to you um, at that time what we considered about 75% complete plans 
for the restoration, not really, a re excuse me, not a restoration, but the, the improvement to access along the edge of the creek from 10th Street um, to the east, then going west towards 8th Street. Basically, from the Belmont Village, the back of Belmont Village, around the Little League Fields, to the, um, and across 8th Street to where the trail continues on and the creek continues on past the U.S. Postal Service facility in Berkeley. Um, we've been working on this project for a while now. We had some um, uh, different forms of outreach to stakeholders, um, in, including Friends of Five Creeks. Um, and um, as I mentioned, we came here in January to get your feedback. We're now at what we hope to be um, considered 90% plans, and you'll see those in a moment. And um, our intention is to complete this design process, take it to the city council in the near future, and um, incorporate it into a updated capital improvement plan so that we can see exactly where the funding and the timing of the uh, improvements can be incorporated into the city's um, public works department program. So with that, unless you have any process questions right off the bat, I'll turn it over to our consultant team to give you the details of the progress that they've made. Hi, I'm Annika Swinehart with Restoration Design Group, and we are a restoration engineering and landscape architecture firm. Um, and as Jeff mentioned, this is not a restoration project. We're not doing any work in the creek or on the banks. It's primarily a trail. It's a path improvement. Um, up on the screen here, you can see the orange box around the area that Jeff just described, um, which sort of shows this is an old master plan for UC Village. And in the old plan, the youth baseball fields had a ton of room, the creek had a ton of room, the trail had a ton of room. And what we're working with now is trying to meet the needs of all three of those areas in the same constrained space. So that's just part of the background. I'm going to use the clicker. And these are just some photos um, of the existing conditions to orient you to where we are in your town. Um, <clears throat> This is the 8th Street crossing um, right over Cordonesis Creek, and you can see the um, Cordonesis Creek Phase 3 improvements um, in that far slide with the rocks and the seating area and the overlook for the creek. And this picture over here is the gateway into the start of this new trail. And this is what things look like today if you're actually on the trail, um, just as a reference point um, for what we're going to be improving. And I'm not going to walk through the entire set of plans because you had a fairly thorough um, review in January. What we're going to be addressing now is what the stakeholder comments were and how we've modified specific areas of the plan to address those comments and try and meet those needs. The, one of the biggest um, feedback points we got was right angled turns on the trail connecting CC3 to CC4. And the orange picture on the left is from the 75% progress set, and the picture on the right is from the current 90% set. And what we want to point out here um, is that the connection from CC3, which is the orange arrow at the bottom, is still primarily the same. You're coming across a raised table um, to the sidewalk on the other side, and you're heading north to connect to the trail along Cordonesis Creek. What has changed significantly is that we have put the road on a diet, rather than having a 24 inch road, we now have a 22, a 24 foot road, we now have a 22 foot road and a 12 foot sidewalk. So we've given two additional feet to pedestrians, bicycles and, and walkers. Um, rather than having a tight right angled turn and a bollard, we've removed the bollard and softened the curve um, to just make for easier mixing of traffic types and reduce nodes for bike and people um, problems. We were also asked to give a sort of north exit from the sidewalk. Um, rather than having to hop the curb or try and find a way across if you're going north, there's a level exit um, from that north sidewalk, which you can then head off to the sidewalk that's north of there or into the parking lot. So it's just a softer, wider, more uniform transition at 8th Street. Um, I'm resisting the urge to use the pointer, so I'm going to put this down. Um, one of the things that is an improvement in terms of safety and use is that once you enter the crossing zone now from the south, 
there's a uniform curb line. It's just a 22 foot wide road. Um, in the 75% set, there were some pockets and dips which caused problems with making for efficient drainage and bike, bike safety and people turning on and off of the table. So we've just sort of streamlined and simplified it um, to make it just softer and easier. One of the unexpected and added benefits of redesigning the road and the crossing is that we've reduced all stormwater that goes directly into the creek. Um, any water, any stormwater from this section of road and feeding into this section of road is now being routed into bioretention. So any, any activity that happens on this stretch of road will go through treatment before it hits the box culvert into the creek. We got a comment about bike racks and making sure there were sufficient bike racks for the Little League fields um, and for users. We did not remove the, we have one bike rack that's at the seating area, the sort of more informal seating area by the creek, but we doubled the number that were available at this end um, by the baseball fields. We were also asked to move them sort of out of the main path of travel, just to again reduce conflicts between people locking up their bikes and people using the pathway. And so we slid the bleachers down a little bit, added some trash and recycling. That was another comment. Provide more places for people to put trash away. All for it. <laughs> so we added trash and recycling here, shifted the bleachers down, and added three bike racks to the north and slid the three that were on the south side just to the other side of the bollards. Um, so hopefully that will make for better and more, pike, better and more bike parking in places that are less in conflict with circulation. We also had comments about both water coming off of the new concrete path and being able to intercept that as it moves around and safety for pedestrians and bicyclists and removing obstructions from right next to the trail. Um, you can see on the 75% set we had log seating almost as an edge control along the trail and the fence at this end And some of the feedback from strollers and rollers was to try and pull that fence back, remove, remove the, the logs away, give ourselves a nice standard two foot shoulder along the trail. Um, I was still worried about protecting the trees. We've just moved the boulders around to protect the trees a little bit more. But you've just generally got more room on the trail, um, a softer edge for the path, and just a little bit more space. And this is an enlargement of the raised table. And it's sort of inverted from the plans you were looking at before. The orange arrow at the top is the path from CC3, from the other side of 8th Street. And basically what happens here is the raised table comes up three inches, and there's a three inch slope down to meet it. So the arrows that you see over the grade portions of the curb are actually rising up to meet the raised table, and the detectable warning is sort of angling down to meet it. So it's a, it's a pretty, it's a comfortable, safe raised table. Um, the, the template that we were given from both Berkeley and Albany was to use the raised crossing that was put in at the development at Parker Place in Berkeley, and that's been installed. Um, it met with the city of Berkeley and the city of Albany's review teams, and it's a simpler crossing, but it meets the standards of providing a raised crossing, letting people in cars know this is a pedestrian crosswalk, and having plenty of signals for that to happen. You can also see in this one um, the notes about the crown of the road um, on the south side will be maintained, and we'll be moving the water into both the bioretention on the bottom of that picture and into a trench drain that carries the water to the bioretention at the north. Um, north of the speed table, the grades are high enough that we can just pitch that road as a sort of a pitched plane um, and just have a vertical curb on the, the creek side, which means that all of the water will be flowing into the bioretention on the CC3 side of the creek. So we'll no longer have an untreated catch basin going straight into the box culvert, which is a plus. And that's just a nice aerial view for you to look at. <laughs>
But those were the main, the main feedbacks that we got from the stakeholder groups, and those were the main changes that happened. Everything else in the, in the plan set is fundamentally the same. <clears throat> so if you have any questions, let me know. When you just mentioned moving the logs back and creating the shoulder along the path, before that you said something about concerns about water sheeting off, so I was just curious how you addressed that. Was it by developing the shoulder or were there other measures? It was just about having the logs up against a paved area and sort of making a little, a little dam, and we just pulled them back two feet so that you have a standard shoulder for infiltration. I have a question about, um, so it sounds like the stakeholders gave input that you obviously incorporated. Just wondering if you've gotten feedback from them or is this part of the process for getting feedback from them about these revised plans? This is the part where I look at Jeff. <laughs> I believe they were distributed. But. Mm -hmm. We'll go far. This is a quick answer. Yes, it was the, these plans were distributed to um, the stakeholders that have been involved uh, uh, Five or six days ago, and they were also let. We also let them know that you were going to be discussing it this evening. Okay, thanks. Were the plans shared with Albany Little League? Yes. Yes, for the microphone. <laughs> I think I asked this last time, but are there locations or places where interpretive signage could go if we wanted to have discussions around the creek? I, the, Yes, you can you sort of, I think it got small. clipped off in the 90% set photo, but on the 70% set, there's a little arrow. Um, it's in there somewhere, I remember. It's, it's right behind the field. It's in the middle section. Yeah, I'll point to it up on the screen. It's location of interpretive element. It is in the 90%, I can say. The, the call yeah, out just is. got clipped. Yeah. On the oh, right, 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 on that, right, right. It's in both of them, so. The, center the idea was to have the interpretive element not be a giant, plastic sign, but to have it worked into either a site boulder or something with a slightly more natural form um, in keeping with the creek. But it would be in that sort of pull-out informal seating area. So it's right here. Oh, Do I want to use the laser, but I'm not going to. Can I ask why you don't want to use the laser? I was told not to. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't show up on the video. Ah. Inadvertently it's, reveal something about I don't know. I know. <laughs> I'll start spelling out the score. Thank you. It the might be helpful for us if you use it, but uh, maybe also gesturing. I don't know. But just because um, I may be speaking on someone over 40 that needs better glasses. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I had a question about the bullard that was removed was uh, at the beginning of your presentation. Mm -hmm. What was that for and why is that not needed now? I think bollards are mostly used to prevent um, cars or bike cars from entering a and bikes from going too fast. But I think it's also seen as a liability risk because people do run into it, um, and it was decided to take it out. I don't think it's actually required. I don't. I think it would be very hard for a car to get very far on that. And I think it was seen more, as more of an issue with mixing pedestrians and bikes in that area to have another vertical impediment there for people to run into and navigate. And there's a lot of people, I think, who have bike trailers who use that path. Um, and I think that was seen as uh, a barrier to having a bike trailer or a double bike coming around that corner. So I have a question. So I, when, I went, when I went to the site to look at these plans, I started um, by Belmont Senior Housing, and I was trying to envision how bikes will pass through. And I was thinking about potential conflicts between uh, pedestrians and um, uh, spectators for the Little League yes. congregating <laughs> in that corner. And I imagine this is something that you probably have thought about. And I guess I'm wondering if you could sort of first sort of walk me through how that transition would work for, for somebody on a bike. Because um, I was having some sort of difficulty imagining what my path would be as I'm coming. Coming from Belmont. From Belmont. And then you see the back of the bleachers, and then there's an end to the trail. Um, on the plans, there's several call-outs where it says, um, 
path guidance uh, signs, TBD, um, whether this is going to be, this is a decision that I think you as a group and the city of Albany need to make about what your use is going to be for this. If during during little league games, is it a dismount zone? Is it a slow zone? Is it a yield to anyone smaller than four feet high? Is you know what 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 your signage rules are going to be for that? But there is this is a, a big concern for little league as well. Is this is better circulation for them? It makes the park and the, the ball fields work better. They've got more room for people to move safely. That chain link fence is coming down. So when you're on site and you're looking at it, you know like in that first picture. Wickety wickety. Over here, that chain link fence is coming out, and the non native vegetation is being cleared back, and we're gaining space in that direction. So it's not as constrained as it looks right now, and there is going to be a 10 foot path in there. Um, and if you look at the demolition plans, you can sort of see where that where that space is coming from, but it is a concern. And I think it's a, a big concern for the Little League, um, and it's a concern for the bikers. And Little League games aren't on all the time, and so when there's not a game in place, I think visually it will be very clear where you're going, particularly with the, the bike racks and the bleachers, and then there's a, there's a clear concrete path sort of heading up and past. Um, that said, during a Little League game, it's going to be crawling with, with people. Um, and so that's a signage and a, and a safety decision I think the city needs to make. We weren't making recommendations on that because of the complexity of the stakeholder relationships, but um, it's, it's, it is a conflict and it is of concern. And so is that a decision that needs to be made before the 100% plans are completed? Uh, how to handle that and what the signage will be? I don't think so. I mean, I think that's something that needs to get decided before the trail is open. Um, Currently, there's no clear way for a bike and Little League to mix in that area either. And what's going to go in is going to be a vast improvement in terms of safety, wayfinding, and circulation. So I wouldn't want that to be a reason to hold up the plans going into place. But I think it's something that needs to be thought about in terms of how the trail is going to be used. Has strollers and rollers commented on this? Yes, population? extensively. Did they have a recommendation for how to handle it? Um, they're really happy there's going to be a 10-foot paved path there <laughs> rather than dirt, chain link, and small children. <laughs> um, and a lot of their concerns were about the 90-degree turns and actually getting from 8th Street to 10th Street. Getting from 10th Street to 8th Street wasn't as much of a, of a, of a comment. Um, but they have walked the whole site with the city of Albany and the city of Berkeley um, traffic departments. If I could just add one more point to that. Um, during the periods of time when there's a lot of activity at the Little League fields and the kids are running around and so forth, the more experienced bicyclists may want to just go all the way around and stay on the roadways and take 10th to, to Monroe and go into the village that way. Um, and when there's not a lot of activity in the fields, then a, a bicyclist of any skill set or level of comfort could, could ride along here at, at a decent speed. <clears throat> Who would decide signage? Just stand up here together. Um, you know, ultimately, I think that will be an interactive process with um, with this commission, if you'd like, with the Traffic and Safety Commission and and staff. Um, I I don't want to try to speculate. I, I, I'd to the degree that we can monitor and move quickly if we see safety issues, I think that's a lot better than just trying to speculate how it's going to function and how people are going to use the area. I just want to clarify, you're asking about safety type of signage, road signage, rather than the interpretive signage, is that correct? Yes, uh, okay. but safety of, uh, like she was saying, with bikes, walk the bikes or, bike yeah. or mm -hmm. look out for little people or something. Right. I, you know, we could, if you feel that, that one of the recommendations that you'd like to see out of this evening's discussion is that we predetermine that, we're happy to do that. Um, but um, coming into tonight, at least for, from my perspective, we were going to kind of take a little bit of a wait and see and see how it works approach to things. Um, but your feedback is valuable. We'd appreciate hearing from you what you think. Are there any other clarifying questions from commissioners before we uh, hear a public comment about this? Oh, yeah. One more comment on the um, 
go slow during baseball. Part of the reason for including that north uh, zero entry exit from the sidewalk coming from eighth is that if you're coming on if you're coming on the trail from sixth to eighth and you get off on the road, you know if the signal has gone out that it's a little league day and you don't even want to go down there, you can be on the sidewalk and get off and head around. Um, and in the 75% set, there was no curb cut at the north side of that sidewalk to exit with a bike. So. Okay, at this point, we'll open up to public comment on this agenda item. So if anybody would like to, uh, from the public would like to speak to this, you can approach the podium. <clears throat> I'm still Susan Schwartz, the head of Friends of Five Creeks. Thank and we are, we are happy, we are so happy to see this close to being built. We have no suggestions. We are delighted that everyone has been heard and seem to be reasonably content. It is not easy. I have been attending meetings on this since 1998. Uh, wow. <laughs> so, we, not just this path, I mean the whole Cotonouses Creek thing and with Judy Lieberman bringing the ball fields people and the creek people together and so on. So it's just wonderful to see this happen to see the prospect of, of, of the Creekside path being complete, but you have to maintain it. <laughs> I'm Shirley Jowell, Vice President of Five Creeks and an Albanian, and I walk everywhere. So I'm delighted that this path will be open. But I do want to say that the maintenance around the paths are really important. Because what I foresee when I'm walking, if the overgrowth and the undergrowth of all the weeds and plants, if they're not maintained, the path gets used less and less. Because I myself want to go because I want to see the beauty of this area, which is, I'm also excited with Susan to see this opening up because I've been working with it a long time. So that's my, my input is that the maintenance of the environment around the paths is really, really important to those of us who walk and look at everything that's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public on this agenda item? Okay, we'll open it up for discussion amongst the commissioners. Can I ask a question of stuff? Absolutely. Uh, what is the maintenance plan for this segment of the creek? <laughs> well, we would like to bring back to you a, a, a full agenda item to discuss that. We do have a plan. We need to work with Susan some more on it. Um, we do have some differences about that that we felt like it would be better for for everyone the commission and and everyone involved that we work through as many of those issues as we can before we bring it to you um it's complicated it's they're challenging social issues that are occurring along coordinates creek which is obvious so if i could defer that discussion for a month or so we would like to bring it back to you it's the next time you have an opportunity um and and explain to you the the whole con the entire con it's a it's a three-way agreement it's complicated friends of five creeks is an important partner in that. It just I don't have a short answer to that. Okay. And I would add, not if possible, not just that little section of that one creek, but give us some information about how all the creeks, uh, what the city is doing to help maintain all the creeks. Sure. Yes, be happy to do that. I just have a general question since you're up there. I just I just find myself having a real difficulty like understand conceptualizing the plan, you know, seeing seeing the plan and visualizing it. And I'm just wondering for the stakeholder engagement process, did these people just know how to was there any mock up or was it really just the plans which not to say that I would expect the city to do more, but just wondering if there was any specific mock up of it at the site. We didn't do any mock ups. We did site walks together and um and, and then we had various iterations of plans as, as they evolved. Um, but I think uh, the, the site walks were really valuable because you can walk this path. Um, it's just not very proved right now. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to add a comment that I have walked this path quite recently and I'm very excited about the prospect of these improvements because I think it's, um, it leaves a lot to be desired currently. 
<clears throat> I think it's fabulous. I have nothing, no, uh, no request. I think it's, it's looks good. Looks really good. I would just like to make a note that with the placeholder for interpretive signage, we do have a commissioner and subcommittee thinking about uh, interpretive signage. So I think this might be a nice addition to that slate. I just like to hear Ben because Ben's a planner, <laughs> and so I'm just given that you've seen many of these plans. Just wanted to hear your perspective on this. So um, I think the the primary thing that caught my attention relates to my previous comment about um, bicycle pedestrian conflicts, particularly during little league games and safety issues with bikes coming through and little children in the area. And, and so um, I think that staff's plan for this is, is a fine one to, to kind of not, you know, to, to move, move forward and see how the space is working and then make decisions about whether or not there needs to be um, uh, additional signage installed or other things that should occur to address this issue. Um, I think my, the, the primary area where I was were sort of focused on was the, um, the 10th Street uh, intersection and, and how that will work. So I guess my, my request for staff and the consultants is that as you're finalizing these plans that you think about that transition and safety concerns um, that may come up there, uh, and 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 so I think that that overall, like everyone, it seems um, I'm very excited about this as well, and I think it's going to be a um, a great benefit. One question that I had, um, sort of, I guess, as a general one for staff is is what's the policy or philosophy about facilitating access to the creek itself, especially for little ones. Is that something that we are generally supportive of, want to facilitate, or is the idea that we want to keep people away from the creek itself in environments like this? <laughs> um, it's, um, it's it's kind of a tricky qu question you're asking because it's it's the it's this is a area that's doing a lot of different things. It's um, it is a recreational area and, and it's a wonderful thought to an image of the kids going down and playing in creeks and and that builds respect for nature and all sorts of wonderful things. Um, it is a habitat um, for steelhead trout and. Um, we don't want people destroying the creek in, in the process of having fun with it. Um, so um, up to this point in other areas of the creek, I don't know that I've heard of a particular problem. Um, the much more, by far, the much greater significance and maybe a, a greater concern with, with uh, is, is the homeless encampments in the creeks and the things that go with that of, of debris and needles and things like that, unfortunately, is really the part, kind of the scary part. Um, there are lots, it's a heavily regulated area, so there are certain things that, that um, um, regulatory agencies want to be able to review before we do some, some of the maintenance work. Um, so it, I'm, I'm, I appreciate maybe I'm not answering your question quite as clearly as you would like, but it's kind of hard to, to balance all that. So it sounds like our, our, our desire is not to fil facilitate um, access to the creek itself, but not to necessarily prevent it from occurring if it does so organically. I, I think that's a, uh, that's a very good way to answer your question. <laughs> yeah. Answer to your own question. <laughs> I, I think that social trails down to the creek will develop, and then part of, I assume, the maintenance plan will be determining whether or not that poses a risk to the infrastructure of the path, and what, you know, if you want to encourage those social paths over others or try and you know, restore them, et cetera. I, I'm sure there'll be kids running down there to get foul balls from the field, um, that kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, it, then it gets into the maintenance issues, which we will bring to you for 
for an extended, well, I'm sure it will be an extended conversation. I'm pretty excited about this too. Thank you guys for taking all the comments and for doing this. Um, I would want a motion that we, what is it, approve the plans, the 90% plans? Are we ready for that? I, I think we are ready for it because you have just made the motion. I'll and second it. All right, everyone in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Okay, it passes. Very exciting. Thank you so much, very exciting. All right, don't move too far away from the podium because the next agenda item is to discuss the Ocean View bocce plans. Um, Something completely different. Okay. Hopefully I'm loud enough with this down a bit. Um, I do, I do want to address, we're, I know we're done with CC4 and you've just passed it, but <laughs> just for the record, the concern about uh, at 10th Street, that is slated for future work, and the idea is to daylight the creek across 10th and there'll be a bridge, and so there's going to be some very clear circulation changes coming at that weird little intersection. It's not going to stay weird forever. So, just, good things are coming. But on to Ocean View, um, just north of where we were. Um, is Ocean View Park, and we gave you a fairly thorough presentation last time on the schematic plans, um, which was what you saw last time, was hand-drawn sketches of um, taking this dark, creepy corner and turning it into an active use and part of the park, and sort of expanding your, your amenities for the public and tying the community garden into the rest of Ocean View Park. What's happened in the meantime is this. Um, you can see my mouse, right? Um, yes. You see that? Okay. Um, what has happened since then is that we've pulled this onto the survey that was commissioned by the city um, and have made it real um, and have laid it out and sized it and done the material work to come up with a constructible plan. Um, one of the changes is that we slid both of the courts north because we had a little more room than we thought and just to give those cork oaks some breathing space. Um, and we lined up the center of the courts more closely with the, the planted area in between the two gates for the community garden. Um, we had also shown you, does this go backwards? Four benches, the, the furnishings were sort of placed in there as standard play, benches at each end for the different teams, and an open space um, either for rentals or tables, or we had, we had shown four backed benches and a round table in that area. Um, in looking at actual furnishings and space, um, this looks a little bit different. We've reduced the amount of furnishings in the space to kind of keep it more open. It's not a huge space back there. Um, and when you have small spaces, it often feels much, much nicer just to have a large bench with space around it than a bunch of little things. Um, so we reduced it to one longer bench at the end, which leaves room at either end here and here um, for players standing at the end before they roll to the other end. Um, and we moved these benches back um, and also to give room for you to stand in front of the bench and still be able to get in and out of the court comfortably. Um, the space between the courts is still five feet clear, so it's not constrained or congested. Um, we still have the three ADA entrances into the courts here, um, and this wall is still solid at that back, the back of the court closest to the cork oaks. Um, this little symbol here is your scoreboard. It's getting real, <laughs> and a scoreboard. And these are the two, the locations for the racks for the balls. You have, you know, one color with four balls and one color with four balls on either end. So this is sort of the, the head of the court at this end, closer to the community garden. Um, we put in some trash and recycling down here because if people are gonna be picnicking or hanging out, um, one would want to collect that. So we added that in. Um, we'll talk about the lighting in, in a later slide, but primarily it's the same layout you saw before it's just in a construction document set with some minor adjustments um, and the materials worked in for the construction documents. These are some images um, for the materials. Um, we stuck with the permeable square Basalite SF Rima 8x8 
pavers. Oh, didn't mean to do that. Cursor is dangerous. Um, this is a very simple bocce rack. Um, off the shelf, you can order them, install them after they're built, and they work just fine. This is what a bocce scoreboard looks like. Um, and if, you know, green team, red team, and those can be mounted to the posts that will be supporting your cafe lights, and we'll get to that in a minute, but it was just about efficiency of materials in a small space. Um, we stuck with wood. Um, the, the faces of the boards and the posts will be pressure treated, but the caps and the, the surfaces that you'll be looking at would be construction grade or grade B redwood sanded and sealed. So you've got a nicer finish on the top than down in the ground. Um, in your packet, there was a little memo about your benches. Currently in the park, what you have are these Demore black metal, um, it's I think called bench 19, <laughs> but that's what you have. Um, and you can, you can go with that and stay with that. Um, they only come in six foot lengths. It's a smaller bench. Um, the prices that are listed here are for materials. The prices that are in your cost estimate are generally double that because that would include installation, contractor markup, delivery, all of that. But this gives you a relative sense of the costs between the two benches that are shown. Um, this bench here is by Landscape Forms um, and it comes in a 118 inch or a nine and a half backed bench. It also comes in shorter lengths um, and it comes in a, in a backless bench as well. Um, it is more expensive, but you would need fewer of them and it would have the same materiality as the quartz. It would be a different look than what's happening at the front of Ocean View, but it would match the wooden, the wooden wire fences from the community garden. It would match the bocce court, polished redwood, um, and it sort of is in keeping with the aesthetics of, of the bocce. And it would match the, the scoreboards and the other accessories that are out there. So what's in your cost estimate is the nicer bench for the bocce area. Um, what is the other option is what you have out there already. And we can come back to that. Drainage is a big issue out there. Um, I think I showed you some fairly dramatic pictures of your ponds under the redwood previously. Um, and shown here is the, the primary catch basin in the lower corner of the property. And this up here to orient you is the catch basin that's behind the fence immediate between the tennis courts and the community garden. And this line here is that existing wood header that's sort of acting like a dam all the way around it. And I've just colored this in slightly to make it read a little bit better, but fundamentally this, this whole bocce area is raised up just a few inches, enough to shed, and it's on permeable pavers, and the bocce courts themselves, they're, um, the subsurface has sort of a V to it and a perforated pipe underneath it. So they'll move water out from that area as well. Um, but we've added an area drain here. And part of that is to collect all of this runoff um, from the Redwood area and from, you know, north of your path and to get it over into the swale heading to the catch basin and to give it time to sort of soak in before it gets to your big, your big catch basin there. Um, we managed to do it with just one, one new piece of infrastructure, but I think it's necessary in order to kind of keep, keep that area as unswampy as possible. Um, and over on this side, we've done a little bit of grading so that you don't get the back ponding in this low spot. Um, by putting in this path, you sort of created a dam, and then you've got this low spot, and we can pull that back, and the water on this side can just head down to the creek. Um, no problem. So it's just sort of raising the bocce up a little bit, moving the water over to the swale, and grading to keep the water moving in the direction it wants to go, um, rather than collecting in little, little pockets around that lawn. Not the most exciting part of the plan, but really important. Ask a quick question. What, wasn't the main drainage on the right? Mm, no. You mean over here? No, this whole, this, this hill right here and this, the whole site is kind of draining this way. This catch basin is higher. This is sort of the high end and it's all heading down this way, but because of the lawn, you had, 
low points and high points inside of that wood header, and then the wood header was creating another series behind it in the redwoods. Yeah. Lighting. Dark, dark, dark back there. So this was the slide from the schematic presentation showing you your existing light post um, and cafe lights supported by wires and little metal posts. And what we've done um, after presenting to you at schematic, we only, initially we had only shown you one additional light post and the comment was, is that enough? And if we have them, and that's the language for path lighting in Ocean View Park, let's just use it as, let's continue that onto those paths. So what we've done here is this is the existing light in orange here. Um, we can run new conduit south and install a new one here. And this one would have a waterproof duplex in the base of it to plug in your cafe lights. Um, at that end. You could also run conduit fairly easily in a straight line over to this corner um, to throw light at this intersection. Even if we don't do that path, probably nice for wayfinding in terms of that, that corner. Um, and then conduit can come down here to this one, um, which would light the other corner of the bocce court. So you'd have a nice grid of four lamp posts highlighting your, where the actual paths are. So when you're coming out of the gate, at University Village, where did my mouse go? Here, there's a very clear direction of where you need to go to get through the park. And in terms of the cafe lights, um, the red circles are around very simple two and a half square inch tube posts that would be embedded in the concrete band that's holding in the edge of the permeable paving. Um, and that's what you would support the cafe lights on. You need to get them up high enough so people can't get to them. And you just have a hook on the end of that and you can string your lights and plug them in here. Um, the comment from the schematic plan was that you wanted to have them. It's a beautiful effect. It'll look fantastic through the redwoods. Maybe you don't want it up all the time. <laughs> Maybe you only want it up for special events. Maybe you want to put it up and then if things go wrong, be able to take it down and put it up as, as you sort of dictates as the bocce courts are open. Um, so what I've done is this is sort of the minimal lighting plan for your cafe lights with posts in those corners. I've avoided putting additional footings close to the cork oaks. Those are large trees um, and cafe lights are not heavy and it's fairly easy to have your arborist put a band around the tree and just run the lights through the trees and it, it can look incredibly beautiful. Or even if you just want to run you know, your, your Christmas lights up into the, into the cork oaks, that's fine too. Um, but I didn't want to put in more materials and infrastructure and concrete than we needed to near those cork, cork oaks. Um, you, could, you could use those posts to string in between the cork oaks and get better coverage with the cafe lights. Um, the lamp posts are going to provide you with a significant amount of light, um, but not very atmospheric light. So this would be the basic general plan for your cafe lighting. And fences and gates, this was something that was shown as a potential improvement that wasn't part of the initial scope for the bocce courts, but in looking at the site and how it feels very back alley right now and very utilitarian, um, how to tie in this new area in a way that feels cohesive with the park. So right now you're looking at the, the entry gate to the community garden. Um, this is the little planting area where the entry court to the, hey, where the entry court to the bocce court um, would be, lined up with this little tree. Um, and this yellow arrow is pointing to a chain link fence that runs between the community garden and the land surrounding that drainage ditch. The community garden is already using that space for fruit trees um, and other, other trees in that space. Um, it's hard to get to them. They're starting to grow through the chain link fence and that area is already secured at this end and the other end and by the tennis court. So you've got a lot of fencing in an area that's being actively used. Um, I don't know the full history of the fruit trees, but um, from a design perspective and someone who's not a community garden member, 
um, my impulse would be to take down the intermediate short chain link fence to give the gardeners access to the sunny area um, and change the fence between the tennis courts and their existing fence here with the same fence they have so that it, it just becomes part of the garden. And if there's concerns about safety around that, there's like a little concrete trench. Um, it'd be easy to put a grate on that or to cover it in some way. It's just a water conveyance. It's not, um, you know, it's, I don't think it's going to be a massive tripping hazard, but that would be something for the city to maybe look at. And, you know, Gail probably has an opinion on that, but it seems like it's a sunny space. It's already being used. Make the fence look nice. Take the ugly one down um, and move on. And the other suggestion was to take the really high cyclone fence along uh, Village Creek down between the community garden and the gate to University Village and have the same fence that you have for the community garden continue along that so that basically you would have a more unified feel in this back space. This would be all consistent along this corner. So when you came down from the other part, once you go through the redwoods as a transition zone, you're entering a space that has a wooden wire fence, the bocce courts, and the unified lighting. Um, and what's happening over at the USDA fence, we're going to cover with native shrubs. <laughs> so <laughs> it'll be fine. But it, it takes this back area and makes it look intentional. It makes it look designed. And it makes it look like part of the park. Um, so that was, that was our suggestion. It's included in your cost estimates as an option to do. We have the design details from the original installation of the community garden. Those can be referenced for the contractor. Um, so it's all sort of set up to happen if, if that gets approved. Ping pong. So <laughs> I got a fantastic email from Shelly um, saying, hey, what about outdoor urban ping pong? Sure. Um, it's become very popular. Um, and there is a lot of information about outdoor ping pong in the world. And so we've picked a spot where a ping pong table could be incorporated into Ocean View Park. And it would be sort of in keeping with modernizing your activities and having space for people that aren't children or tennis players to use the park. Um, and we looked through a bunch of different ping pong table options. And these were the two. Um, that seem to fit your space the best. You can get solid, custom, concrete ping pong tables made. They're incredibly heavy. Um, they're about $5,000 cost, but that doesn't include transporting the cast concrete table to your site. And once you install it, you can't really move it that easily around. Um, and with Ocean View Park, it seems like um, having something that you can install, and if you want to take it out and move it to a different park, or you want to reorient it somewhere else later, that that would be useful for the city to think about. Um, both of these ping pong table options um, are outdoor rated, um, are in use in the city of Portland parks. They're in use in Vancouver parks. Um, they can handle snow, rain. Um, they're anti-graffiti. They apparently have really good playing surfaces. I am not a ping pong person, but apparently that matters. Um, the one that we're recommending to the city is the Cornelieu Park Outdoor Table for the simple reason that it um, has slightly larger members. All the corners are rounded. And in terms of a park with a lot of activity, it's, um, it's a little more durable. Um, the Jula City Outdoor Table has been installed all over park Portland. It's durable. Um, it's not as... Um, adjustable in terms of level. The Cornelieu has washers and shims that you can sort of level it better with. Um, and it doesn't have any round, any rounded bits. It is a square pointy ping pong table. But it's a fantastic square pointy ping pong table. So I think the, the decision is this was a new introduction between the schematic plans that you were shown and today. Um, this is where we would put it. These are two options for it. If you want ping pong. Here's some ping pong. I'm not sure what else to say about it, Shelley, unless you've got additional comments. That was great. Um, the other additional improvement that we recommended um, at the schematic phase was pulling that path from 
the University Village Gate all the way up into the main part of the park so that the Redwood Grove isn't um, isolated against the fence and that it doesn't um, act as a barrier to circulation. Um, it can be its own shady, wonderful spot, but that if you're coming out of the University Village Gate and you really just want to get up to the playground or you want to get up to um, you know, the portable units, you would have a way of moving forward. We don't have survey for this area. Um, where the trees are shown on the survey and where the trees are in real life don't match up, um, but in terms of site verification, there's plenty of room to pull a path in there. How it ties in um, to the existing seating area, there's a sort of a concrete, uh, it looks like maybe there was an intention to have the path go that way and then it just got chopped off, they never finished it. Um, it was an ad alternate in the, in the previous 2007 set, but there's a full four feet between this bench here and the railing. There's, it's, it's a path, and then there's a bench at, on, the, on the back side of the path. So our thought was just to make that real and um, at this point pull, pull the asphalt around, clear some of the acacia out of there, remove that header, remove the drainage problems, and have there be a clear line of circulation on that side of the park as well. And that's, that's the end of that. But overall, um, those were the main, main additions and changes and things that we wanted your feedback on um, for the plan set. Um, but otherwise, it, it's, it's pretty much what you looked at before. So could I ask you to, to go back to showing the location of the ping pong table, or possible location of the ping pong table? Yes. Sorry, I just... No, it is totally fine. Lighting. So that is, um, this is that playground area. This is the start of the Redwood Grove. Um, this is the, the path that heads down towards the community garden. And there's this sort of triangular space between the planting area um, and the playground. And this is the footprint of a outdoor ping pong table. Um, oh, Lord, wrong way. This is the danger of using the mouse. Um, and these dashed lines here line up with the width of the path. So if people are just running or riding, um, what we wanted to look at was can you tuck, there's room to tuck it farther in, but I wanted to see if you could get it with you know, plenty of space on this side as well. You've got a ton of concrete over here. People aren't necessarily gonna stay in that imaginary line once they clear, you know, once they clear the area. This, this is a, a fairly large area, you can see here. Um, but tucking it out of that seems like the way to go. And is it correct that that, that uh, dot or a dash box around it is kind of best practice clearance? That's actually just sort of a limit of work line. The, the, okay. you, I was gonna say, cause I've seen some YouTube line, videos and ping pong takes a lot of room around it. <laughs> you, you can barely see it, it's a little too light, it's something yeah. we'll fix, but right here and right here, there's a very fine dotted line so the, the clear zone is, is well within your paved area. This okay, is just okay. the limit of work line. Okay, um, got it, got it. Yeah, it's like right here to there. So could people there. easily get around? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, while, no, while, get while, while yeah. Playing? yeah. I would just mention, uh, my concern more, having played a lot of softball, there's that's where people warm up for softball. There's, there's oh. balls going all around, there's balls coming fast, there's kids running, there's a lot going on on what? softball nights. <laughs> there are, there are. So um, it's tucked out of the way, but I'm not sure. You it's could stretch out of the way. on it, right? You could put well, a leg up. You can stretch you on the pink pad. People throwing balls. Balls. Oh, yeah, well. <laughs> but yeah. Why are you throwing balls right there? So, so for the ping pong table, did you did you consider any other locations, particularly that sort of circular space that's a little bit further west? This guy over here. Yes, that guy. Can you point to it again? I'm sorry. Um, right, oh wait, where did it go? I think you're referring to this area, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I met Sand, with the- right? No, it's, a, it's, oh, it's, it's a, like a little um, meeting stage area for f the Friendship Club building that's there. So it's kind of part of their, it's not like exclusive stage area, but the, um, when they put that in, it was supposed to be like a little auditorium and there's a, um, a little platform area where you can have music or something. It, it, it was a teen center at one time, but hmm. that kind of, that zone is a little bit on the Friendship Club side. Um, not that it, they keep people out, but um, this 
spot, I made this recommendation to plop it there, is that it, it's, it is tucked in, it's close to the playground, but it's also kind of close to Friendship Club. And then if you get into the big cement area, that is really like where softball, baseball is happening. And there could be, you know, a future score booth or something that might be in that space. And then once you get down near the tennis courts, that just becomes really tight in terms of playing like around a ping pong table. So this seemed like the largest area and still close to the action um, of the play area and the, and the friendship club. When I was out there thinking about it, the only other spot I could envision was that circular space, which um, kind of seems like it's under the domain of the friendship club. <laughs> and it's so this model that you're recommending, it, it could be relocated. Mm. Yes, you, you, you just bolt it into the concrete, and then you would have to patch it, but you could move it. Uh. They claim you can install it with only two people. <laughs> I don't know if I believe it. Depends on which two people. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> heavy, heavy machine. <laughs> so, so you didn't get into the budget, but there's the budget estimate in our packet. And yes. It looks like a lot more than what we were anticipating. I was wondering if that was something we'd talk about either now or um, after public comment. A lot of the, um, the, the costs went up after really assessing the drainage and the issues in that backspace. Um, also, since 2015, I think when the 50,000 was set, um, construction costs have gone um, fairly skyward fairly rapidly. So it's a combination of those things. And part of why on the cost estimate, I split out the ping pong and your options and the rest of it was to be clear about a lot of this is about just drainage and clearing and, and just building materials. Um, so that's, that's why it's not, we didn't pick super fancy pavers or anything like that. It was just more. Yeah, I did notice that I was looking at that budget too. And it seems like a lot of the budget, um, like 60,000 is in the site furnishings. Yeah. I'm just wondering if there's any room. I mean, I, I guess maybe the question to you, Shelley, is what we're, if we were to say, yeah, this looks good. What are we exactly proving? You know, because I don't. You know, are, it's almost as if implicit that we're approving this budget if we're approving the plan, right? Um, if I understood the the two actions you could take tonight is that this was a Measure R funded project, so um, you could choose from various things, and then you obviously you would have to increase the uh, the budget for this project out of Measure R. So. You could say we like the way the plan looks and we have enough money in Measure R to pay for the entire project and that could be an option. You could say we would actually don't want to do a few of the things that aren't required and but we want to get the main part in and increase the budget that much. Yeah, I get, and this is obviously not a question for the consultant, but just about Measure R funds. What mm -hmm. is the, what are we, what are we at right now with our balance? Oh yeah, it's in the, um, it's in the staff report. Yeah. I there can. is a, there's about 180,000 that is available. That, uh, the $50,000 is not included in that amount. And we've spent about $20,000 and that's in doing the survey for the area and then for design services. But that means... Obviously, then we would be spending on nothing else because there were other things that we'd considered. Um, but are there additional measure R? There's, wasn't there something we voted on recently that's going to... Uh, approve the mountain biking that we we're waiting on that. Not necessarily for measure R in particular, but yeah. There, and then there's a couple other things that will... Um, that hopefully are coming down the line, which is Prop 68, um, and that is a, a state funding for parks and that's a per capita so we could submit a project for that those funds and that could be the mountain biking um, at well, that time actually the mountain biking was from measure r that was we had a list of possible things for measure r funding as considering yeah for yeah, considering so that was measure r mm -hmm. and we've already paid some money out of measure r funds for that for the plan and, and who knows what else and and the estimate for that was something like 50 to eighty thousand, something like that of course, mm -hmm. we thought this was 50,000 and now it's 150,000. So mm -hmm. if the mountain biking park goes from 50,000 to 150,000, like this project did, then um, that would be some hard decisions. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if we, I, I am 
bringing up the Prop 68 because we can't submit for a project. The minimum amount for small cities is two hundred thousand dollars. But that's so that, like like requesting grant funding, or I mean, it's per it, capita. So you just have to submit the project. So it's not competitive. Yeah, yeah I guess I personally. Oh, one oh. other thing I just want to say about mountain biking is that. It's gonna be a little while on mountain biking and, and there's a couple great factors that are a part of this is that um, if the affordable housing project that goes in there, there will be that bike path that would be tied into that and some possible other elements in terms of a lot of dirt that would be moved in uh, for us from that site to our mountain biking because um, they have a lot of dirt they wanna get rid of and we need dirt. Um, and so those two are kind of getting tied together and I know that they'll start that project if, if it gets uh, moving forward, but. I, I don't know about the rest of the commissioners, but I feel like I need to better understand like what we have available now, what we have coming up, what's the, you know, in the horizon, not just like this year, but five year kind of thing, if possible, even three years, whatever we yeah. have. Um, and that's yeah, all I, I have, expect, yeah, that's okay. all we have. Those no, are the only things on, the measure R that was passed is more uh, park maintenance th uh, funds and you'll get a presentation on that. That's measure M, I think is the. Okay, as, yeah, but. I don't know about you guys. I, I, I don't feel, I mean, I don't expect you to have the answer right now. So maybe next meeting we can talk about specifically, like I'd like to just have on paper, this is how much is left. This is what we might spend it on. And sort of, I can feel like I can make an informed decision considering all the various, you know, desires of the public. I mean, honestly, I haven't, anyway, we're kind of, I'm I just wanna, yeah, now, just to so uh, say that maybe we should hold the discussion. I think we have, um, if there are clarifying questions though for our design team, or um, if you wanna make additional comments, then I wanna make sure we allow the public to make comments about oh, yeah, this sorry. as well. Have you, one clarifying question is Measure R, is there a, a time limit on Measure R or is it? It's a good question, yeah. We're supposed to be spending that money because uh, we are done um, collecting. For that, so that's why you'll. That's why we're seeing all these projects come to uh, to a plan uh, in terms of like Albany Hills Measure R. We had this limit, limited amount of money, and then everything else has almost been spent. So, we are trying to get that completed. Is there a hard deadline? Like there, have there a, isn't a hard deadline because there was a September 2019 that we sh were supposed to show that we had a plan okay. in place to spend the money. We have to be able to. Okay. Yeah. And the only other um, item that is in there is the feasibility study um, for Pier Street Park. Um, that's already been set aside. Um, and also money has that been That wasn't included in the 180 you just mentioned. Correct, okay. it's already been set aside. And, and a clarifying point is that this project was fast-tracked as quickly as possible to go from schematic to construction, a contractor has not bid on this yet. And so one of the things that can happen with the Bocce Court project is that we can do the construction documents for all of the improvements and they can go out to bid and the contractors can break out the different components for you. Um, and once you have the bids, you can decide which parts you want to build. There's, there's normally a design development phase where things get refined and then this happens and then it goes out to bid and so on, but I think it's, maybe because of Measure R, but it's it's been a compressed schedule. So this cost estimate is basically a design development cost estimate, and it has not gone through the bid process. Um, there's also the option of not having the contractor purchase furnishings and items, having the city purchase them directly so that you're not paying the contractor markup and you're not having that happen if the city is set up to do that. Um, there's ways to reduce the site furnishings cost that does not involve a contractor. So you, ha you have some options in that regard. I had a clarifying question about the proposal for the community garden. Um, the, it sounds like you're talking about um, kind of expanding the community garden into the allowing, uh, taking away a fence that separates the community garden from the, where the trench is, where the fruit trees are, I think. And um, yeah, we're not actually, uh, proposing expanding the community garden. We're proposing um, unifying the fence design and removing fences that are um, duplicating effort and are currently in the way of an already expanded community garden. That, that if you head back in there, it's, it's full of fruit trees. <laughs> so it's being used by the community garden. It's the, I think it's the sunny spot they get. Um, and it's, it's just a suggestion on our part as sort of acknowledging use and um, you know, removing that fence won't cost you very much, but it might make a lot of people really happy and it'll look a lot better. So that's just your, that's just design recommendations. Part of me was wondering is if they would be even, or I'm not quite sure exactly how the spaces are used, you've described it well, but 
if they would want to move some of their southern plantings to that northern area because of the southern shade and if, if what you're proposing doing would allow them to do that move to the sunny or northern part but more easily then that would be something to, that we might want to consider as a good thing community garden is on the, isn't necessarily in this item but um, when we start talking about that that could be a proposal for community gardeners to think about the fact that they have a shed on the sunny side mm. um, and maybe doing a little flip-flop mm. moving some of their gardens where the shed area is and that removing this fence would make it feel like there's a little bit more space over there maybe yes. and then moving the shed into the shady side. Oh, that's interesting yeah so it, and it, that may not have to happen right now, but it's, it would be a nice thing to kind of kick that into, into motion. Just mm. um, Also to clarify what you said about uh, the contracting, if we approve this as is, for example, we could also as contractors come up uh, Nick's entire parts of it. Um, I think if you if you approve the plan as is, we would then progress and complete the 100% construction documents um, and turn that into the city, and the city would be able to tell us um, we would like to have, you know, the fence improvements as bid alternate one. We would like to have, you know, we, we can label in the plan for the contractors who will be bidding on the set how they set up their cost estimate. And that would make it easier for you to make decisions about which portions you want to build in what order. And if Measure R will cover all of it and that's what you decide to do with it, fantastic. But if you decide really you just want to do the grading, the bocce courts and the lighting, you can do that. And you can save the fence and the path extension and the ping pong for later. So. I'm sorry, one point, sorry about that. So um, if I'm reading this correctly, so the, the cost for the, the path and the fence and the ping pong table aren't, is not included in the- It's on- um, it's, it's, it's on the back of the- but Yeah, it's, additional it's item- the Total is what I'm saying. Correct, it is, okay. I mean, they're not, they're not large, but- No, I'm, I'm just saying it's not included. Large. Correct. Okay. As we're talking about budget, we're not including those at correct. this point. Right? Okay. And ping pong can come out of it. We can consider rec reserves Understood. for ping pong, yeah. Understood. Uh, uh, just wondering, um, in ter well, maybe this is a question for Shelley in terms of like process, doing those 100% plans, is that like within the scope of your work right now in terms of our budget? Is We're so currently contracted to deliver 100% plans. Okay. So. But obviously we wouldn't want to go to the 100% and be like, oops, never mind, do that. <laughs> I just want to kind of understand the process that so we should be pretty set on what we want to do before doing the 100% plans. Otherwise it's a waste of, well, that's that's yeah. one way to look at it. Or mm -hmm. we do the 100% plans for all the possible improvements you want in that area. You get the bids, and then you decide what you want to take out. How you how you want to tackle that? That's within our budget to do that. I I'm not sure I follow your question. Uh, yes, I'm just a consultant, so I know like sometimes it's an on-call contract, and you just pay per. You know, I can imagine doing full plans for many different variations would be more. Correct, which okay. is why doing one set of plans for everything is what's currently in our okay. in our set. It's yep. the cost estimate where you would be doing your sort of special menu of items. We wouldn't want to produce different plans based on different permutations. Sure, absolutely. So. Okay. Can you just, be, oh, sorry, go ahead, Hillary. I just wanted to know if, Shelley, you could speak a little bit more about the um, Prop 68, because I just want to make sure I'm familiar with what that is. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's not on here because they haven't totally released that yet, but that is, uh, was approved, Prop 68 is through the state, and it's for parks. Um, there's a number of different areas that they have funding for, and this one, and they call it a per capita, um, which means that basically we would be submitting plans for whatever it is to, like we did for Measure WW, um, and um, they have stated that the minimum amount that each city, even the smallest cities would get would be $200,000. So per year or? No, it's just a one, one time. time. Mm -hmm. And does it have specific stipulations for play fields or for like what? Uh, not like Measure R, okay. no. Um, it's more open in terms of recreation. Um, they, there is a part about um, serving communities that are disadvantaged or severely disadvantaged, which uh, we are not either one of those, but uh, that just means the city has to have matching funds, and that is 20%, and so that's a, not a large amount for a $200,000 amount of money, so. Great, thank you. And is that the only other money coming down the line 
didn't we vote on something recently? It wasn't, um, that's, I think, is Measure M. That's yeah. the one, but that's park maintenance. Yeah. That, okay, that wasn't for infrastructure. Okay. Right. Yeah. This, um, this is not on questions, but this item has been in the city CIP since, I think, 2015 um, as a project that has been approved by council in the CIP. So or, uh, it'd be great to move it forward and, and get it going. I realize it does use Measure R, but... We didn't have anything else that really was like, this is what we wanted to spend Measure R, excluding mountain biking. Um, the other projects that we're finishing up were all through Measure WW. And those will be done soon, but. Um, my concern is that some of the old timers, it seems like have talked about some of the lean years where the Parks and Rec Commission has had basically no money to spend for quite a while. And then now we're trying to burn through Measure R funds, which has been something we've been working on. And uh, to count on, I, it, it would be good to hear more about uh, the funding of the what's possibly coming available. So just, um, I just again want to make sure we allow for public comment before we get into discussion. But I think, Hillary, did you have a comment or a question? Um, I'm just curious why some of the plants that could be smaller pot sizes, like yarrow or sedge, are gallons. I mean... I know you want to get stuff established really, rather quickly, but I guess I was just curious, especially because there's going to be irrigation. Like, why? It, they they can they can go down to some like like yarrow can go down to a four inch pot. Those are standard pricing sizes for an SD or a DD set. And if you look at the cost estimate, it's sort of just an allowance. Um, and some plants, as I'm sure everyone knows, some plants are cheaper than others, and so it's um, it's just a unit cost. We tend to do perennials at one, shrubs at five, trees at 15, and we use that for pricing. And then when we do the final set, we adjust and can go down on those. But it doesn't actually affect the pricing as much as you would think it would because, you know, Achillea is cheap, but some other ones aren't. So it kind of comes out in the wash in terms of the, the line item for, for cost, so. Any other clarifying questions from anyone on the commission before? I wouldn't be inclined to inhibit this process from going forward based upon there not being any additional funds or things that have happened in the past. Overall, it sounds like improvements. It sounds like a great plan to improve the park, seeing what could happen with the community gardens, moving them into the sunshine. And uh, what you brought up about the trenching, that, that would be a safety hazard. And if there's something that could be, if that could be addressed so that that's uh, a safer space because, Thanks. well, <laughs> because angles. My wife is in claims management. I don't want to put her name in it, but there's always trip and falls and cities getting sued and things like that. So, uh, and also when you're dealing with irrigation, the improvements, the upgrade, all of this to me is a win-win situation. And I wouldn't want to inhibit this project based upon trying to limit funds or save some money for something else that we could pretty much control ourselves as far as what we want to spend on other projects. I think this is a, a benefit and an upgrade and I'd love to see it go forward. Any other clarifying questions? Um, uh, yeah, I have a clarifying question just about the pricing. And we don't have to, to get deep into this, but because the, there was like 60000 for the site furnishings, I'm just wondering about variability in some of that pricing. Like, for example, the path lights. Or, yeah, the path lights seem pretty pricey. Those are the three um, lamp posts. And are they required? I'm just wondering what's like what we could what we could minimize in terms of pricing. So the 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 three. So the other thing to notice is that over on the the right hand column for for those ten foot posts, those three lamps, mm -hmm. um, the unit cost is five thousand five hundred. And if you follow it over, it's you know oh, I don't know my glasses on twenty six or twenty eight twenty five. If someone's got better eyes for the materials, um, we tend to double that in the cost estimate at this phase to include installation and other issues. The actual, the actual fixture is only a portion of the cost. Um, no, I understand. It's yeah. just my, my question is like, do we have to have the lighting there you do at not, all? You do not have to have all three. That okay. was the suggestion from the committee from the schematic phase. And it was partly about um, making sure that this entry was lit and this was lit and that you had a light over here by the kiosk so that this whole area wasn't dark because that part of the park is currently completely unlit. Right. Um, so that was sort of a safety decision that the committee recommended. Um, 
And you know, what would be the optional thing would be to take out the posts and the cafe lighting. Um, that isn't that big of a ticket item. What, what, what is the ticket item is pulling your new conduit and, and installing the new electrical features. Um, but in terms of what I would cut, I'm not sure that I would recommend removing those four, removing the three new light lamp posts to have a consistent path lighting plan for Ocean View Park. Those, those sort of old-fashioned lamp posts go all the way up and are kind of how you mark wayfinding through the park. And so having that continue to the back gate, um, you know, we could, we could get rid of this one. We could drop that one um, and still have these two for the cafe lights and for the, the gate and the dark corner. You could reduce one. Um, yeah, no, I, I guess I'm just trying to see the bigger, and if it's just one, maybe might, you know, it looks like most of it's there, in there the running of the new conduit. There sort of so. in every corner, you know, okay. and part of, part of reducing the, the benches here was to try and bring the costs down as we were looking at, you know, rather than having four six-foot backed benches and four, you know, backless benches, having just two backless and three backed and trying to make, make that work, because that's, that's how you kind of, they call it value engineering, but it, you're not engineering value, you're just reducing your project. <laughs> so th there's ways that we can work on bringing it down, but I'm not sure that um, it's going to have as dramatic effect as, as one would hope. Okay, so. thanks. I'm relatively new to looking at construction documents, and so help me understand that. So I, I can see several parts of this project. One is we have a sort of swamp mess in the park, and so we're trying to, to fix that, which would be whatever we put there, if we ever put anything there, we would need to address, potentially. And also you have an issue of we're putting bocce courts there, but you could put bocce courts on a more finished area in another park. I'm not saying we would, but I'm saying you could take something like Key Root Median, which is um, a flat, grassy area, and you could put bocce courts in there. If I look at the budget estimate, it looks like it's about $60,000 for the paving and grading and the actual bocce court materials themselves, um, which is not that different from the original estimate. But help me understand in a sort of, if you came into a sort of flat, grassy area where you didn't have this sort of, um, this sort of challenge around the drainage and the, you know, from a pre-existing situation. Is there still always going to be additional cost around drainage for bocce installation or you're, generally you're no? You're still going to need the, the drainage underneath the court because the court has to actually be held completely level. Yeah. Right? And so it's the subgrade that you have the slope and then you have the perf pipe out of that. And so you would still need to, in a perfectly flat area, move that water somewhere and connect it to something or, or daylight it. Okay. Um, and you would still probably need to have lighting, and you would still probably need to have benches. Like it just, yeah, it's, it's part the of the court thing. The itself is is just the court. It's creating the use space for the court that it starts to kind of uh, elevate the okay. price. Great, thank you. And if, I'm, I'm just going to go back to budget too. But if we doing some of the numbers here, the the mid range estimate of the 163,000, we still have 30,000 of the other set aside funds. So that would mean, if you were going with the full thing, that you'd be uh, allocated another 133,000 to the project, and then that would leave a, a balance of $47,000 in Measure R, if you were to do the, the full. And you don't see material costs or contractor costs going down anytime soon, do you? Oh, no, no. <laughs> Uh, that, that's, that's my point. <laughs> One question I had, and, and I apologize, maybe you went over this at the last meeting and I, and I, when I wasn't here, but what's the maintenance window like for the surface of the bocce? Like what would we be looking at? How often and how costly can that get? Maintenance for bocce courts is actually really easy. It involves a seven foot rake. Um, the part, the, the surface, you can do bocce courts in a variety of different surfaces. Um, using the, what we've recommended here is called Bachiman Rain Country Blend, and it's an oyster shell blend. And part of why we recommend that is that it's of an extremely fine particulate, and so it's actually self-leveling. Um, rougher, like if you use DG, um, or you use uh, you know, other grain sizes that are larger, they'll t in a heavy storm on a completely flat surface, they'll tend to move and aggrade. And there's, there's some public bocce courts in Emeryville on the bike path sort of from Berkeley Bowl um, down through Emeryville. And those are DG. And they are in constant need of repair. And part of it is that it's not self-leveling and there's no drainage underneath them. Um, they will 
they'll fill up a little bit and then sort of self-level and it'll drain. Um, you want it to sort of do that in big storms a little bit, but basically you need a big metal rake um, and they sell them. You get it with, with your blend and you can just rake it occasionally. Um, we don't get as much, I shouldn't even say that, maybe we will, but in Portland or Vancouver, um, you can get moss that will grow on it. Um, and then again, you just sort of rake it and redistribute it and dry it out and you're fine. Um, after about five years, you may need to top up a little bit, but um, you don't generally need to. So it's, it's not a high maintenance situation. Um, it's actually more maintenance to have AstroTurf or to have DG or to have an alternate in place. So. I had a quick clar clarifying question. On the price, <coughs> uh, at the bottom it mentioned shrubs, 5,000 something dollars, 213 shrubs. Can you point to two of them on one of those? Oh, I didn't go through the planting on this because it wasn't a contentious issue, but I can pull that up. I didn't bring the pretty pictures from the schematic plan either, so. So these here are the Westringia, which is the low coast rosemary, um, which was selected because you don't have to prune it or hedge it. It tops out at about three or four feet. Um, and you know, you don't want boxwood back there. <laughs> you, you don't want to have to deal with that. Um, and but the rest of the rest of it is is largely largely native plantings. And these these are large circles, but that's going to be a single five gallon shrub. Um, and the idea is that these are a mix of deciduous and evergreen flowering native creekside planting. Um, and this is to help screen your USDA facility on that side. Um, we didn't do as much planting up in here. We did some though to help define the edge of the path. We left this area open um, because it's the largest gap between the existing red trees there, redwood trees there. And if there's going to be um, people running back and forth, that's where they're going to do it. So there's no point in sacrificing plants to feet. Um, and we didn't want to formalize the path in any way. We can kind of see where that goes. But those are, these are all ferns and woodland strawberry um, and sort of shady redwood grove appropriate plants on that, on that side to kind of help tie that into the area a little bit. But it's not a ton of plants. Any other last uh, clarifying questions before we open it up for public comment? I have a quick question for Shelley on process. So for park improvement plans like this, these don't go to the city council, right? They will, uh, um, when they go to uh, put it out for a public bid, um, usually the plans go with that. Uh -huh. Yeah. And they would approve also the funding side of it as well. Okay, so, to, so do they, so they'll see the plans before putting it out for a public bid? Um, it, sometimes the plans will be in the uh, council packets and sometimes the plans are not, so uh, it goes, it's gone both ways, um, but it can. And they, uh, they also have to, these, we're making a recommendation to council, so council uh -huh. will also have to approve the funding side of it as well. Uh -huh. So they'll, they'll, they'll take action to approve the funding for it, and at that time will they also be looking at the plans? That's what I mean. Sometimes that sometimes is included they do, sometimes they don't. in terms of the, because usually it'll go in two, two action items in the one staff report, uh, which is to go out to bid and the funding uh, uh -huh. side of it. Uh -huh. And so, and so they'll, be, they'll be considering a recommendation from us on moving funds around as well as how much to use for this project. Correct. At this time, we'll open up to public comment about the bocce design. 
All right. At this time, we'll bring it back to the commission for discussion. So I have one other question about funding, which um, is based on that last question, is uh, say we approve the whole thing as is, and it sounds like later on down the line we could have some discretion as to what actually gets built. Um, but say the city council then approves the whole thing and allocates the funding, then if, if we in the end decide to do maybe half of it now uh, when the contractors come up and, and, and at that point, then can the rest of those funds be used for other things or have they been earmarked for this so they just sit in a fund somewhere waiting for more bocce court projects later? I'm not sure if I exactly understand the question. Um, they could be used for something else. You just mean so if... Just like so say we approve this and the city council approves it and it's $160,000 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Can we later on use some of that same $160,000 for other things if we don't actually go forward with some of the uh, yes. those things here? Yes. Mm -hmm. The other um, the way you could do this is also just set a... a the amount of money that you want to allocate out of Measure R, set a, a dollar amount for that. So actually you're creating your own budget, so you'd have to then eliminate a number of items. Say you want to allocate $100,000 from, uh, from Measure R, then you're really creating a strict budget for yourself. So you would have to look to eliminate if it's 100 shrubs or you know what those things are in order to stay within that budget. Sorry about your shrubs. Well, yeah, you could do, I mean, shrubbing is definitely something you do later. That seems like, but I don't even know how much that takes down. Mm -hmm. Wondering, uh, oh, sorry. Somebody else has a question, go ahead. I just lost my train of thought. Go ahead. No, no, I, I no. just, uh, my, my comment was, I was really caught by the rosemary, and I like the idea of adding some more herbs, uh, like something drought tolerant, and like thyme or oregano or something. That Very might, Mediterranean. Give it a it's more Australian rosemary, feel, right? so you can't really cook with it. I'm sure, <laughs> but, but, but you could with thyme or oregano. I'm not, yes, yes, just yes. for the scent. I'm yeah. you'll, you'll get some sun. I mean, and this is also, you know, this space over here, um, very intentionally, we did not put any tables in there um, with the thought that once this space is built and it's immediately adjacent to the community garden and this back area is lit and comfortable, um, this is also a spot where if the Friendship Club wants to have some terracotta pots and do herbs, if you want, there, there's space here for other things um, and that can be incorporated later. I have a question. I have a question, Shelley, about um, Ocean View, about UC Berkeley, if they know about this at all. I, I mean, I don't, this is Albany land, but I'm just wondering, this is going to benefit their residents a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if they'd be potentially uh, just approach them about matching funds. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't have an answer for that. I know, hard, but I'm so, I tell it you, we do, we do have a lot of. Uh, they are Albany residents, the village, uh, the village people. Right. Sorry for that. Um, and the, we just have really high use of that back gate. It is uh, a lot of people come in and out of that that section. Um, this part of this, which is not really why we're doing the path, we're just trying to create nice circulation through that really awful area. But it does connect into the bike path on Buchanan, which is included in the active transportation plan as a suggestion. Um, so it kind of starts to serve a lot of things when we make these connections back there. It's just unfortunate that of the, the status of the park back at that area right now, um, it is dark and that's the biggest complaint. People are scared to be back there. So to activate the space in this way will make a huge impact in this park uh, for the community, I really think. And I do think that you could probably eliminate a few of the things in here that might seem like things that we could take on later or plant things with city staff that, um, you know, that would add up, but you'd still, in essence, get a really nice lighted area that is a, um, that has the bocce courts and the space for e events and family gatherings. So it seems to me that the city's been at this for five years now, and we should move the process forward. Um, I think we have uh, excellent uh, plans that have been prepared. And um, my recommendation was that we move forward with the preparation of the 100% plans, as well as um, uh, to allocate funding for um, the project uh, uh, as, as, it's, as it's envisioned um, with the expectation that when the bids come in, 
um, we'll be able to make a decision about you know, how, how we want to spend our money. But I, I, I do think that, that, that putting, putting the 100% the plans out for bid um, with sort of the full package of, of possibilities is the right course of action. And if that's a motion, clarify. if that's a motion, I'm seconding that. Well, I, I just want to clarify, I'm not, I'd like to have a little more discussion. I, from, I've been on the commission, Todd has too, for a few years, you know, uh, well, Todd much longer than me, but we, I felt like we just approved the bocce ball course just over a year, a year ago. So it hasn't been like five years planning. No, it, well, not the planning part, but right. it, it no, it has been included in the CIP since. As something to consider for, right, as one of the things to fund. But I, I don't, I remember us talking about the list of things to do. And it was on there, but we were still deciding amongst others too, weren't we? It was, it was included in Measure WW funding. It was a Measure WW oh, okay. funded project okay. that um, was included in the CIP. And when the bathroom projects were going to cost a little bit more, we, the group made the decision to move the funds, those Measure WW funds to the bathroom uh, memorial park projects so those would be completed and then to use measure r funding the project's been in there the funding source has just okay changed yeah okay that's helpful um and I, I think we've been talking about the path extension even longer or yeah that's that's been a real need yeah one, one I, thing okay. though, I think that we should just bring up is this is a lot going on in ocean view right like we're packing a lot in not that that's a bad thing but Last year, we had talked about the lack of parking there and how there were the potential right to expand like two parking spots for where there was sand. And I know people can park along Marin or is it Buchanan there? Anyway, um, but I just, you know, and if there's pickleball and there's the Friendship Club is exclusively there. So I just want to have us all, you know, remember, I think it's a good thing to approve this, but that we, we should also be thinking about the larger picture of like how people access and are able to use Ocean View because it is kind of a, it's hard, it's kind of hard to get to and there's so much there. Yeah. I mean, it's probably not a surprise to several people on the commission that I'm a huge lover of bocce. And so of course I'm, I'm very excited to see this these plans, and I also appreciate the thoughtful attention. I, I, I play bocce in different cities and different communities, and so I appreciate the attention to detail and making it feel like a real world-class, top-notch kind of experience, which is different from maybe some other ways that parks are activated. Um, it has a very sort of urbanized feel, and that you've put those details in is something that I would appreciate as a player or as someone that, you know, if I had a party there. I will also say that as a huge champion of this, when I saw the budget cost, I had like like cartoon eyes going out just because it was so substantially more than what we had put in there. And what I take from tonight's conversation that I think is helpful for me to remember and having just recently been through that part of the park and really looked at that space is that right now we have in our small community, a very disused and actually kind of like not very welcoming space in a park that regardless of what we do or don't put there probably needs to be addressed at some point by this commission and by the city. So I kind of take the note of the fact that there's a potential path improvement, that there's lighting and safety improvements, there's drainage improvements, all of which make the park more accessible and usable by our community. That's over and above and separate from the fact that I think this is a really nice amenity and a cool addition to what we have to offer that meets a wide range of age needs, which was one of my original comments about it. People of all ages can play bocce. Um, it's not something that, you know, requires Prowess. A, a lot of athletic ability. And, um, and I also, I think it does add sort of an element of fun. I have to say with the ping pong table, I actually, I appreciate that Friendship Club is there, but I found myself wondering, if that was something that could fit in Memorial Park, where there's so much more space and where perhaps that would add um, a different element there and you have high school students. It, it just, I wondered if maybe that is kind of squeezed in and I haven't really looked at that aspect of this because I was a little disoriented exactly to where it was. So I would go look at that again. Um, but I also agree with uh, Ben that if we're gonna put it out to bid, which I would strongly hope we can, um, that putting it out in the full package and not sort of 
nickel and diming it at this end of things makes more sense to sort of see what comes back. And of course, we don't know what the bids will come back in. So that's always a question mark. Um, and then there'd have to be some decision making and conversation. But uh, I appreciate the plans. I think it could be a real ex exciting addition. And I do think it addresses some safety and just desirability issues of that part of the park. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually am looking forward to having conversation with the community garden about other things. And so I think it's exciting to think that maybe there would be some enhancements there. Um, and aesthetically, I think the fencing situation could really use this uh, improvement as well. So I, I had to say that I really appreciate the plans. And I, you know, if this was $50,000, I'd be like, yeah, slam dunk. I, my real concern is just other things we're not funding. And I, I don't think we should just be like, oh, yeah, yeah. And it's so easy to just, once you do one step, then you do two steps, then you do three steps, and you're proving. With that, let's, let's think for a second about what the public wants. Because honestly, I've never seen a bocce ball contingency come here to speak on this topic. Like, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, I don't think maybe you're speaking for the public, and it's not like we're just jumping on a bandwagon. No, 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 no. So I'm not saying that. that the fact that these are improvements that are much needed, and the reason that it's not being utilized now because it's it's very unattractive, it's very unsafe. Yeah, but we're it's not but enhancing. Non, so I don't banking. think that we should halt progress because we're saying because you can't hinder progress because we're saying too much is happening at one time. This has been on the table for five years. I don't. And albeit I'm not, though, I'm just coming on board. Uh, I want to go ahead and let you finish saying because I'm not. I'm not saying that. Um, uh, what I'm saying is we're choosing this over something else, like, like the mountain biking park. That, I, have I don't think we should hinder the funds for something that hasn't come to the table yet. That has come to the and table. That we don't have to let them dictate the mountain biking people that we need more money. We can tell them exactly. Yeah, the mountain biking people have come to the table. Though. I want to let no. go ahead and let Julia have the floor, and then we'll we'll toss it back over here so everyone can complete their thought. What, um, I'm done. I'm complete. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah. No. I'm just. I'm not saying I actually like this plan, and I would like it to go forward. And I do think that there are other things that we may want to fund. We may want to fund the mountain biking park. We're about to hear the dog park subcommittee a response about some really, you know, th a lot of things that the public does want. I just haven't seen the the bocce ball court people come before us, but maybe that's because they've come years ago and I just haven't seen them. I just don't remember. So um, that's my concern is thinking about the public and if if the public, if I saw like a group of people saying yes, like I, who is it the, uh, the not the tennis, what is Pickleball. it? Pickleball. Pickleball, yes. Like they were out full force. I'm just wondering, and that's kind of where I want to understand the funding. By funding this, does that mean we don't fund the pickleball courts, that we don't fund the mountain biking? I just want to understand, because I feel like I'm not making a totally informed decision. At the same time, if we're just saying, go ahead and do the construction plans, and we're not allocating funds, that's different. But I just want to really know now, because we end up going down the road by saying, yes, spend more money on the construction plans. Yeah, so. yeah that, that's my concern as well. For example, say the mountain biking project comes up. Say, say we approve this, 160, 170,000, whatever it is. Um, then next month, mountain biking project comes up. And they say, oh, yeah, here's our finished plans. Caltrans says we're a go. Um, we need 80,000. And it was all part of our Measure R list with this list of Measure R uh, items we were considering. We funded the lighting at Memorial Park, and we, we've been moving forward with the bocce courts. We approved the plans for the mountain biking, and then now say mountain biking says, oh, yeah, now we need the money we said we needed, which was 50, 80,000, whatever it was. And then I, I'm wondering, is Shelley going to say, well, actually, commissioners, you just allocated all the Measure R funds. We have no measure our funds. Now we just have to sit and wait and hope that something else comes up. So Shelly, that's a question for you. Say uh, dog parks, say mountain biking comes back to us, um, mountain biking that's already in the works, for example, and we have had people coming here saying that they want to see it happen. Um, uh, what would our budget situation be if we approved this 100 and whatever thousand it is? Uh, the, the, the balance in Measure R is 180000 So I said tonight that if the mid-range was 163, if you were to, and we have 30000 um, that we have not used from the set-aside, that would put um, moving $133,000 from Measure R, leaving $47,000 in that fund. So that's one thing. Um, on Prop 68, that is a thing that we're going to be looking for projects uh, to use that money for. It just hasn't come out yet, but we're on the list. We've said we want to be a part of the per capita uh, and submit park projects for that. 
a little less restrictive. So dog parks can't, you, we're, the city attorney said that's not gonna qualify for Measure R funds. That goes back a bunch of different meetings um, ago. So the dog park would have to be handled in a different, uh, different way. Mountain biking, the only, there's a, the question because it's not our property. So it's not a done deal that we just have a decision that we could just make. Um, but I think that is like the next big project that the commission is gonna be looking at. And I would be suggesting that that would be a great project for either the remaining $47,000 uh, and also part of that Prop 68. Prop 68 could pay for a dog park as well if the dog park goes through. But um, those probably aren't large amenities in terms of the dog park um, side of it like something with bocce and furnishings and, and things. So there will be additional funding coming down the pike. That per capita for is the minimum amount is $200,000. That's so just like kind of like the measure WW projects that. So even for a community our size, we might get more than $200,000 if we submit pro projects that are deemed. Yeah, they still have to define what that is, but they've set a minimum. Okay. So. And that kind of budget would come to us or it would come to uh, parks, it's, programs, educational programs? No, it's for capital projects, yes. So it, it just, uh, when we went through the whole process with Measure WW, it's that same process. What are the, uh, do we have any projects that we've been waiting to fund that are in the CIP that we haven't had funding for? Are there new projects that have come from the community um, that we wanna have a project use this money for? So then we would submit our plans and all the required hoops to jump through. And then that gets approved by them and then we start a project. That's really how Measure WW has worked. Okay, and we had a lighting project that came through a couple meetings ago, the Memorial Park Lighting Project. Mm -hmm. Is that some, what funds would those come through? That's part of Measure WW, uh, depending on how much the bathrooms take, but we have um, rec reserves used to finish the funding for that. So we have money left for that. And this yeah. wouldn't work. Rec for reserves is outside of. Field. Okay. This wouldn't apply. Yeah. I think we have a motion and a second, is it time? Can we have it restated again, just because there was a lot of discussion, I want to make sure. Ben, do you want to make a motion? Yeah. I think the, the motion is um, staff's recommendation to approve the, the design um, uh, with, are there, are there any specific options within the design that you need our specific? Do we need to mention the ping pong table and the path and things like that? Or, or the benches, the, the bench choice? We would need that feedback before completing the sets, but we don't need it tonight, uh -huh. if that makes sense. Uh -huh. Like the, the placeholder is there, and what you would prefer to have, we can do. Okay, so we would be able to get bids on the different options and then... Bid for the whole option, the whole project. For the 100% set, um, we would do the drawings for all of the improvements. Mm -hmm. um, Selecting bench A versus bench B is something that we would need feedback from you prior to submitting the, the set because you would only have one furnishing in the set, uh -huh. but we don't need to decide that tonight. Um, well, we're going to talk about this again before it goes. No, I mean you you can talk to Shelley or you know you can. I mean I don't. I'm not going to interfere with your process, but it's not. Mm -hmm. What's in the plans currently is the preferred option, not what's existing at. At the wood, the wood ones are what's wood in the plan, ones. which yes, is the correct. most expensive potential option and the one that fits in design-wise. So what you're submitting is that the plans would have correct. those the options, options, and then if we wanted to yes. do something different, we'd, okay. In terms of, oh, sorry. It was mostly, we showed you those two. What's in the plans is the preferred options. We're showing you what the, the downgrade would be should that come to pass. Yeah, so I think the Correct, motion, Shelley. <laughs> uh, the motion would be to for the city to move forward with um, uh, the, the recommended project design um, for public bid um, and for, um, and I guess, you know, Shelley, it's a little bit unclear to me on, on the allocation of funds. I mean, that's a decision that's gonna happen in the future, and it seems like the first step is to get the bid and then to, to decide how to pay for it and how much the city's willing to pay for it. You can allocate the, you can make the suggestion to allocate the funds. It doesn't mean you're gonna use all of the funds. So just a recommendation. Yeah. yeah. I'm just noticing in the agenda, this is information only. Is it appropriate for us to? What's that? In the agenda, yeah, this is marked as information only. Oh no, that's, that's the dog, the dog I'm sorry. Oh, I think. Okay. <laughs> it's just a recommendation. Can we, um, oh. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, we might be saying the same thing. For the additional items, could we split those off and do them separately? Or do you mean the ping pong table? Yeah, or? like the ping pong table, the additional path, and then the community yeah, garden. I think that's the idea with the 100% bid. It's the f it's the full package, and then once we get the bid on that, then we can decide in our recommendation to the city council, we oh, don't think that this is a wise use of city. Absolutely. Um, and and I guess like my project. concern is with like, say the community garden piece, like we have the whole subcommittee and they might move and we want to bring this as an option. So it doesn't tie us into right. it. That's, no, okay. no, we're just finding out how much it's going to cost and then deciding if we want to buy it. The one thing that I would say you could probably take out is ping pong. It's, it's really, we, uh, we asked them to research and make a dis recommendation on what the best ping pong table would be, but uh, we can handle that separately because I think the funding for that would be from something like rec reserves rather than it won't come out of this project anyways. Um, and when you go out for a bid for something like this, do you put a cap on it or generally you just see what people come back with? Yeah. You see what people come back with. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to restate what I think I heard, which is the recommendation that you're making a motion to uh, recommend as the city you're making a motion that we approve the sending it out to 100% um, plans and, and recommend approving the plans as designed to the city council. And we are making a recommendation that the funding come from the measure R remaining funding. Is that a correct, although less eloquent than you've said it, um, restatement? Do we have a second for that? I second that motion. Everyone in favor, please say I'm, aye. I'm not gonna not say, I just have a question. Does this mean that this is going straight? If we did make this approval, then this isn't coming back to us? Is it coming back to us so, after this? So that's another question. Af after the bids return, does that come to us or does it go to council? We have to, we'd have to accept the bid is um, the lowest bidder. And then we kind of wrestle through um, the alternates, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And we've had projects go out to bid and they were too high and we, sure. yeah. bathrooms for example, um, and we said no and didn't accept any of them. And you go out at, at a different time. So I guess that's why I'm not totally comfortable with all the additional items being part of it at this point then. Like I think the ping pong table and the community garden fence should probably be separate and I, I'm curious to hear what people think about that additional pathway and whether or not that can be funded by Measure R um, just because those seem really separate than the court. That's, that's why I asked my last question. They're listed in the cost estimate as um, additional. A, additional items at the bottom and in advancing the 100% set, what we can do on the recommendation of the council is have we can either take the ping pong table out and you guys can just deal with that later and Shelly's nodding, so maybe that would be the thing is yeah, so. the ping pong table and the path extension come out of, you know, come out of this set and we okay. list bid alternates for the fencing. Um, I would say that I would recommend if not changing the lighting or the fencing because those are gonna have the greatest impact on safety, visibility, and I think sort of framing that space. I don't know that I would consider the fencing um, secondary. So I th the thing for us is that we're, we have a whole subcommittee to talk about whether or not the community garden should stay there because they've requested that they move um, because it's so shaded. So one of the options that I think we want to discuss with um, them is whether or not removing the fencing would help them be able to stay there, but I wouldn't, I guess, I wouldn't want things to accidentally go forward and redo a fence if they're definitely gonna leave because that space might become something different in the future. So that's why I guess I would, I, I like your motion, but I would say like, let's do it without, you know, the additional items at this point. The we, we could advance the set, we could advance the plans to the 100% set with the fencing improvements um, at the perimeter and um, the path extension north as bid alternates on the bottom, separate from the main bulk of the bid. And we can just pretend the ping pong didn't happen and Shelly can take that information where it needs to go. Does that sound um, like an adequate motion or should we, do we need to vote on the one that you've already advanced and that's been seconded and then make a decision? 
No, that sounds adequate because what she's saying is that there are options there. Let's right. let it go to public yeah. bid, and then we can go ahead. What she said. What she said. Absolutely. We have still a second. Yes, we but do. Can I just under, I, I, I want to understand what I'm. Okay. Yeah, I want to understand what I'm voting on. Because if I'm voting on yes, go ahead with the 100% complete plans. We're going to go out to bid. Am I also voting on? And then I'll dis, and then it disappears and goes to council. Or is this almost like we're saying yes, this is what we want council to adopt? Or is it going to come back to us after we have the we have to see the bids, and then we decide whether or not we want to recommend it to go to council. You're, you're saying yes to the, the main top stuff, right? Then there's three additional items that are optional, and, and we're going to take out ping pong, and it makes sense that uh, the community garden be treated separately. If the bids come back and they're, they're high and we want to remove some items, then we, will, we can have a discussion I think about what that. she's asking is, are we going to see it again before it goes to bid? No, we, no, no. After, are we going to see? Yeah, asking? either after before it goes, back. after it comes back after from goes. bid, or, are we going to see it again? Or if or there's not. an issue with the cost, yeah. If everybody comes back hunky dory, then we're good. Otherwise, we're basically approving this amount, which is a hundred some odd, hundred thirty thirty to go to council. Yes, we're. Uh -huh. Is another option to approve about half of this and then wait for Prop 68 funds for the other half? Absolutely not. I don't have the exact timeline on Prop 68, so I can't answer that part. Do we have a timeline for this? It's Measure R, so we were supposed to be showing that we're spending this money because we've stopped. That's part of that, the assessment, which has ended. Um, and this is the last remaining bulk of the money. Albany Hill has a plan, so they're going to spend that money. And that construction will start soon. So I need to call for a vote. We need to stop this. And, and we don't. Has, doesn't have to be unanimous. Yeah. Um, we, can, we can have nays. That's fine. But we, we need to vote. We so to we had a motion on the floor. We have a second. Everyone that's in favor of moving this forward, say aye. 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 Everyone opposed? Any abstentions? OK, so we have, I think it carries. Um, I am going to note that there's an interest in hearing more about Prop 68 and understanding more about the balance yeah. of funds. Mm -hmm. So perhaps at the July meeting, we could yeah, I, that or the following one. Yeah, I'll totally track. Uh, it just hasn't come out on the state site yet. The, yeah. We've done the initial thing. I've done a couple webinars. That nothing has. N there's no action yet, and, and except saying that yes, we want money, which was. <laughs> so I'm also aware that we have a media agenda item still to come um, on, with reflecting a lot of work that's been done by the dog park subcommittee. So I want to sort of move us on to that, and I'm going to turn it over to. Julia or Todd? Oh, yeah. So um, you, uh, Brian's going to put something up on the PowerPoint. Should we get up? Should we get up there or no? I, I don't know. If, if Is he going to present from there? He can present from there. Uh, Do you want to present from? Can I present from here? You just, yeah. I don't mind presenting from here just because. Mm hmm okay. okay. Yeah, sure. I've seen this. I'm going to be back in just a minute. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Is, can you put the agenda up on the screen or something instead? Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> you don't want to see your passcode?
Okay, so um, we're gonna, pr uh, Todd, Brian, and I are gonna present the update on the dog park subcommittee. Um, what we just wanted to give you all is just an overview of what we've done to date because we're um, hoping to have a more, maybe a meteor discussion next month when you've had a chance to think about it a little more. Oh, great. And, um, and then make a recommendation to council about what to do. So just to give you an a overview, back in fall, we did the Memorial Park Section B neighborhood survey and a Section B user survey. Um, then we did a general online um, dog park survey for the whole community in spring of 2019. Todd's gonna present that. Um, we just conducted a dog park community workshop just last, just last week, I think, May 30th. May 30th. And then um, today is our commission meeting. We're gonna give you an update and we're hoping to nail this down by next, by July, the next July meeting. Um, and then present something to council in July, if not after the August recess in September. So besides this, which is a whole bunch of data points, we also interviewed the Albany police chief about um, issues with Section B and just dogs in general in Albany. We have a petition from Section B users that was, I think, submitted some several months ago. We have historic emails that Shelley has received from Section B neighbors, um, you know, some complaints and concerns, and also concerns from dog users at Section B over the years. Um, we also have police records of responses to Section B, and then we have a we have a we just received, I think, a petition for. A, to have a small dog park in Albany. And then from um, the general online survey, we also the, generated some discussion next door, so we have those comments too. We're not gonna present all this tonight. This is actually the additional feedback that we're not gonna present tonight, which we could present or be part of the discussion when we eventually have it about what to recommend to council. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I just wanna give you an overview. Okay, so I just wanted, to, we presented Section B results a few months ago, but I think like only half of our commission was here. And it was like mostly the dog park subcommittee and Ben. <laughs> so you, the rest of you actually haven't seen this. And um, I just wanted to give a few data points of that very robust outreach to Section B, which is what most people think of as the dog park in Albany, but um, we've presented about the fact that it is not a dog park exclusively. It's a multi-use area, and there's a history behind that. We're not gonna go into that tonight, but Shelley has you know, very art well articulated to the groups that have been here about what that history is. Um, but what we did wanna tell you is what we've done. So back in the fall, I mentioned, we did a neighborhood survey where Todd, Brian, and I hung door hangers on 43 households that, um, let me just go back to this, that just bordered, so it was Thousand Oaks, Carmel Avenue, that bordered Section B, very close to the perimeter there. We knocked on the doors, and we also offered an online survey that they could fill out specifically if they didn't wanna respond um, in person. But through that very robust outreach, we actually talked to over 60%, 60%, 26 of the 43 households. Then we also did a separate user survey where we went to Section B, like afternoon, noon, evening, weekdays, weekends, over the course of two weekends and weekdays, and completed 107 surveys, and those were just multiple choice. So we're gonna present, just to give you some very big takeaways from that, one of the biggest takeaways was um, of those 23 neighbors that we interviewed, the majority were positive, actually, about what's using that area as an off-leash dog area. 62% um, were positive, 19% were negative, but if you even look at the numbers, like 62, like 19% represents like six or seven users. I, sorry, I, I have to um, look at that specifically, so I don't have that exact number. Um, and a lot of people liked it. I think the people, some of the neighbors, just to give you a sense, some of the ones that didn't like it, really didn't like it. Do you see what I'm saying? But there was also people that loved it. So I just want to, it's hard to give the emotional content where you're just showing quanti um, quanti 
quantifiable results, but that was just something to know. Their main concerns were noise, not just dogs barking, but people talking and arguing, and then parking, which we thought was interesting. Um, then we also interviewed the user, we just got survey information from the user, so this was really just a multiple choice survey, and what we found was that well over half, like 70% looks like, lived very, well, actually, that's not true. One mile away can be, can be within driving distance too, but that 41% lived with just, just within a few blocks. A lot of people walk there. Um, even people, though, who walk there sometimes also drove there sometimes, so it wasn't exclusively, you know, people drove to Section B. But when we asked the question, I choose Section B over other local dog parks, it was definitely because of location and convenience. Um, they really felt that there was a strong sense of community. Actually, they really talked about how Section B dogs and dog owners were actually nicer <laughs> and more sort of more well-behaved and conscientious than other communities of you know, dog parks. I think Ohlone was named as one that was a little bit rough around the edges um, and safe. And the, they were, like I said, well-behaved dogs and friendly dog owners. And that's just to say is I, I did, one of the things that I took away from talking to the dog owners there is that they really felt like it was a second home for them in many ways, that, that neighborhood, and that the location convenience thing was so important that, um, you know, just thinking about offering a different dog park somewhere else wouldn't necessarily solve, uh, would feel like a loss to them if it was not in the exact same or very close location, if that makes sense, because it was about location. Okay, that's all I have to say about that. I also have a report that was attached that you guys can look um, into more deeply if you have any other questions, but I'm gonna hand it over to Todd, who's gonna talk about the general survey results. Okay, so I'm going to try to abbreviate this in respect of the time and also in respect of the fact that we will be generating a report that will have all this stuff in it anyway, so uh, we'll see what we can do here. So basically, we after looking at section B, we decided we want uh, to broaden it up a little bit, um, uh, to kind of get to the core questions that we were tasked with. Uh, is there a need or a desire for dog facilities, additional dog facilities in Albany? What features would be important? And what would be a good location? Uh, so we did a completely online survey this time, no door knocking. Uh, uh, it was open to everybody, uh, but we were mostly looking for feedback from people with dogs because these were the people we were trying to gauge. We wanted to be talking to the people who were going to use the facility. Uh, this was publicized, uh, thank you, Shelley, by the city e-news and uh, the city's next door account. Uh, we placed signs at Memorial Park Section B, uh, Terrace Park, and the Bulb. I also placed signs at Memorial Park Lawn at Dartmouth, but they got torn down. And I didn't, after they immediately got torn down, I didn't feel like I should put them up again, so, so I didn't. But what's significant is that does play into the responses we got. So we got 206 responses uh, that were received before the deadline. It was only about two weeks, so I, thought I was very pleased with that response. Uh, 235 of those are folks who have a dog and uh, 20 who have or walk a dog and 25 who don't. Uh, I just want, I mentioned the respondents, I thought I'd mention, uh, uh, one of the questions was where do you go, what do you use? And 30% of the people were using the bulb, 24 were using Albany Beach, 20% uh, were using Section B, 14% Terrace Park, 6% uh, Memorial Park Lawn, and 6% uh, the Greenway at Dartmouth. Uh, so anyway, that I just, as I was looking over these results again, that might be part of the results that we're, we're getting here. All right, so the first question very directly, is there a need or desire uh, for additional facilities in Albany? And it seemed clearly that people, you know, the people who would use these facilities would like more. So 53% uh, flat out, there's not enough, we need more. Uh, and then right amount, and then, uh, the, the others. Uh, so I think for me this suggests that if we were to build an additional, additional facility it would be used. Then we started asking about features and we asked this in a few different ways uh, and uh, but I think this is maybe the clearest we, we information we got. Uh, location is a key reason to use the area, strongly agree so and, and somewhat agree. This ties in a lot with what Julie was saying that people want to be able to uh, get there conveniently, ideally they want to walk. Now, uh, we did ask uh, also, how do you get there? And 47% drive, 25% walk, 26% uh, both, drive and walk, and 2% bike, which I thought was pretty, I couldn't do that with my dog, so that was pretty <laughs> um, uh, So, but people clearly want something that's convenient for them, so uh, keep that in mind when we look at locations. We might want to locate this somewhere that is, is 
you know, there's, there's not neat much else around. A ground surface is a key reason. The reason we ask this is because we're thinking of Section B and other facilities, and it's grass. And grass means in order to keep it maintained and so that it can be viable throughout the year, it needs to be closed for part of the time. So we, we were kind of asking the question, how important is the grass surface to you? It was pretty important, um, not overwhelming, and in fact, later on in the survey, we asked if you had to choose between grass or a facility that could be open year-round, it was not even close. 50% would choose a facility open year-round, and 34% would choose the grass over that. So uh, push comes to shove, they'd rather have something that's open year-round and not grass than uh, grass and closed part of the year. Uh, size is a key reason I use this area. Strongly agree, somewhat agree. Uh, we, we, this specific question didn't ask about, you know, whether that means large or small, but another question did, and clearly they wanted a larger area rather than a smaller area. Uh, the one related comment we got is they would like a small, an area for, specifically for small dogs. Uh, but that's a very strong response. Uh, key is, size is a key reason. It makes sense we all have, you know, this area with small yards. Uh, fencing is a key reason I use this area. This one is very neutral. There's not a lot of response here. Uh, this might be showing what I mentioned before, responded so heavy on the bulb in the beach, which isn't fenced uh, specifically. So, uh, uh, but anyway, fairly neutral response. Fencing is important if you have a dog that doesn't be, uh, you know, you're, you're training a puppy or doesn't have great recall or is going to be distracted by a, a squirrel or a car or something. So that's where fencing is. So here we come up with some, you know, some features we might want to look at. Uh, we know it needs to be well located. Uh, ground surface is flexible. Uh, grass would be preferred, but if it's the option is to be open year round, that might be a, a reasonable trade-off. Uh, larger is better generally, and fencing it seems like it could go either way. All right. <clears throat> Oh, we did ask, uh, we'd ask features in another way, and I just, we asked, I think there were like 15 options, and the top four, open your round was number one, uh, number one. A varied area like the bulb, so like a place to explore was number two, 15%. A large area is 15%, and then something that's open early uh, was the number four, and then it kind of dropped off pretty quickly after that. All right, so then it was on to locations. So these are the current kind of po most popular, uh, well-known anyway, uh, off-leash kind of places to run your dog in Albany. I know, can I? There, there. I know I'm not supposed to do this. But. <laughs> so there's Memorial Park Section B up there. Uh, familiar with that. Uh, Terrace Park, the large lawn there. It gets a lot of use by dogs and not dogs. Greenway Dartmouth, that's another place that gets a lot of general use as well as a popular place to run your dog, and then the bulb and neck. Now you'll notice I've only highlighted this, the stretch of, of the neck here, which is the, the city's region area, and then the bulb itself. This is what the city has uh, control over, at least at this point. This is East Bay Regional Parks, the, the beach and uh, the plateau. All right. Uh, so I would just mention just quickly that part of our public event was asking people for feedback on these, on how it's working now, and also for some of them anyway, potentially what it might look like if those were to turn into a dog park. And, and Brian will talk more about that later. So then over the you know, few years that we've been thinking of this, some options or possibilities have presented themselves uh, for a new facility, possibly a, a dedicated dog park somewhere in Albany. And we, we mapped these and asked folks what they thought about them. And so I'll just quickly run through those. Uh, there's a part of Key Root that had some very stunted trees. It's about a large half of block between uh, just near Washington. Uh, that could potentially work. Uh, somewhere along the Greenway, uh, there's a couple large, these large blocks uh, north of Washington. There's not a whole lot going on. I guess there's, I mean, at Garfield, you've got the uh, sculpture. In Portland, you have the sculpture, of course. But, but there's a lot of area there. Uh, so you could potentially have something there. Uh, rear of Ocean View Park, now we were formulating this before the bocce ball uh, was, was so advanced and so a plan initially was that a better home would be found for the community garden and then this whole area could potentially become uh, a dog park. Uh, now it, it, you know, now bocce ball is going to be going, the bocce ball is right there, one half, so really the only spot we're looking there now is where the community garden is now, and again, presuming it finds a better location in it. Uh, so anyway, that one is not such a live issue anymore. It's quite small at this point anyway, so at best maybe a small dog park if, it, if that's what we were looking at. But then there's this one that was kind of 
uh, unusual, and I, I heard about this from Shelley. I'm not sure who came up with the idea, but this is Caltrans owned property uh, next to the train tracks on the far side of the train tracks going under, you know, to underneath the freeway, depending on, on what they would provide for us. Uh, it's a large area. Uh, it's in a section of the, the city that doesn't have a lot of access, or it doesn't have other facilities except for the bulb here, which is kind of a long ways out. And um, uh, anyway, it's an interesting, in, interesting opportunity. So we asked folks for feedback both in our event, uh, oh, uh, actually, I'm still talking about the survey. In the survey, uh, there wasn't a clear uh, preference. Um, now, these are asking for, just for these new facilities, you know, kind of disregard what's already there, but if for these new facilities, does one of these strike you as much better than the others? And there wasn't really a strong preference. Uh, we did these, these scores by, we gave everybody three choices, I think, out of four options, and gave, uh, uh, you know, three points for first choice, two points for second choice, one point for third choice, and, and totaled it up, and it comes out pretty much an even split. So we didn't get a whole lot there. That's why we asked about it at the public event and where we got more feedback, and that will be, more detailed will be, feedback will be in the report, but I think Brian has some basic or initial feedback for you. Okay, I wanted to briefly take a look at um, two dog parks that I believe are the two that are closest to us to get the basic idea of what official dog parks can look like, um, and then uh, take a look at what, the, what happened with the workshop. So uh, what you're looking at there is a rough outline of what Albany looks like. A memorial park you can see is in the northeast corner of Albany. And if you go about two and a half miles north of us um, of Memorial Park on, uh, on the greenway at Potrero is what's in El Cerrito is the Bruce King Memorial Dog Park. And if you go about two miles south of Memorial Park, you'll get to Ohlone Dog Park uh, in Berkeley. And that's at MLK, at Hearst and MLK, the, the furthest east the, dog, the uh, Ohlone Greenway goes is where that is. And so let's take a quick look at those. Here's the Bruce King Memorial Dog Park in El Cerrito. Uh, Potrero is what I'm standing on there looking north. You can see it's right at the BART tracks and a uh, jogging path, bike path to the left. Uh, Denny's is right there if you know where Denny's is on San Pablo Avenue. Um, and there's, uh, they have a double gating system. This is the entrance and to the left is the small dog park and to the right is the large dog area and what we're looking at is like the atrium, the lobby. And you can see that the park is closed from, uh, I can't read it, 9 a.m. to 7 a.m., right? No, 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. So that means it opens at 7 a.m. every day at 365 days a year and it closes at 9 p.m. Uh, Every, every night. Um, they have a cute little, this is the small dog area, cute little carnival ride kind of sign mm -hmm. saying, you know, you, you can go in here if your dog is less than this high. So that's the small dog area, looking from the atrium area, the lobby area. And then this is the large dog park area, looking back at that double gated area. Um, and if we look in the large dog park area, uh, we see a few things. Actually, let me go back. Um, first of all, the width is roughly 33 feet. I just kind of paste it. And, um, and then it's right next to homes to the east and right across the street from a bunch of houses. And if you look down the fence line on the west, you can see it's right by, the bar, uh, by an apartment building there and the bar tracks and the path. Uh, it's about a hip high fence, but pretty low fence. It does have water and some other amenities. It's a few feet over from the curb so people can open their door, um, things like that. It has their rules posted. We're not gonna go through all their rules. Um, and then this is the Ohlone Dog Park in Berkeley. It's also a wood chipped uh, dog park. It's open 365 days a year. Uh, they have a few amenities. You can see benches, a cute little fire hydrant. Um, and it's a much bigger space. It's uh, wider. Um, and this is the little dog area. It has a double gated system to get into that that you're seeing to the left. And the big dog park area is on the other side of the far fence. Um, posted are 
rules, phone numbers to call in the city for various issues that might come up with the park, uh, the hours. This one's open 8 a.m. most days, 9 a.m. other days, and it closes at, I can't read that, 9 p.m.? 8 p.m. 8 p.m. 8 p.m. every day. So that's 365 days a year. It's open by 8 or 9 a.m. every day. It closes at 8 p.m. Um, and uh, they have reminders for noise and the green sign on the left. Oh, also, it's a keyed entry for employees. I, I would assume it's for employees. Otherwise, it's like what we have in Memorial Park, uh, sorry, Section B, where it's um, on a timer. So you just can't get in uh, through the gate when it's uh, outside the time limit. Um, this is the two gate, the double, how they handle the double gated system to keep dogs from bolting out while one person's coming in for example. Um, they have signs posted around. Also, you can see, um, I don't show it, but behind me is Hearst. And of course, there's houses on all up and down one side of Hearst. Um, but then in front of me, looking north, is an uh, apartment building just inches away from the fence. So there's hundreds of people, presumably, you know, living right there. And they have signs, not just there, but around. They have several of these that remind users to be courteous and you know stop continuous barking is how they put it. Um, there's also a group that uh, helps maintain the park. So uh, there's a organization that um, of residents, of users, and I don't know the details on that, but somebody that was at our workshop informed us a little bit more about that. Um, and now this is from our May 30th workshop. We had Julia, Todd, and myself presenting, people in attendance. Uh, hearing the summary of what's been going on and then we had them get up and we had butcher paper around the room and for Terrace Park, Albany Bulb and the Ohlone Greenway at Dartmouth we had them write down what they thought about the current usage and how those things were pros and cons of dogs in those areas and then for the things down below um, we said well these are potential dog park locations what are pros and cons for these um, a part, a section B, key route in that one particular place, somewhere on the greenway, open space near the train tracks, other locations that people could recommend. And we also took input on amenities and on questions. And so then people got up and they started interacting with us. Um, and they started also um, writing on the butcher paper, uh, pros and cons in all, uh, various places and also amenities lists. Um, questions they had for us, and then we gave them stickers to go around and kind of vote on which item somebody had written, pro or con, resonated with them, they thought was important, and then we um, uh, looked at all of that. Um, so uh, a closer look at some of the places we were looking at that Todd mentioned um, that people were giving us input on in, uh, in the online survey and in the workshop. Uh, here, for example, is the Key Route Boulevard location. Todd mentioned the trees were stunted. You can clearly see that they're compared to the rest of the block. This is um, just immediately north of Washington on Key Route. Um, and I paced that off. And from curb to curb, it's 33 feet. You'd have to go in, I think, two feet on each side to allow doors to open. So that would be about roughly four feet less, so that would be more like 29 feet in width if you went as far as you could with the fencing mm -hmm. um, and allow people to open their doors. Uh, we saw, as, a, as you saw the Bruce King Memorial Park in El Cerrito, that one's about 33 feet uh, fence to fence. Um, and uh, then this is, um, we had said any, somewhere on Ohlone, and so I've been walking up and down Ohlone, and there's several places that look pretty much just like this. Um, so I took pictures of this one spot. Uh, this is just north of Dartmouth a little bit. So south of Dartmouth is where there's an open field. So it widens there at the creek at the border with Berkeley, and then this is north of Dartmouth, half a block. Um, and there's a... Uh, a, a section there that's 43 feet from 
if you uh, fenced in the, as the asphalt path is crumbling, you know, all around the up and down the greenway. So you know, if you fence that in as part of the dog park and go up to the jogging path, that's the 43 foot um, section there. And it goes for many, many, many feet north south. Um, and you could sort of choose, you know, how, how far do you want it to be. Um, and there's some other places, like I said, on the Greenway that are similar to this, but that's one example. This is a closer look at the um, area west of the train tracks, right next to the train tracks. Um, what we're looking at right here is basically the in the yellow trapezoid uh, in the upper left-hand corner. It's just sort of one little, the right-hand corner of that is the, all the open area that's not under a, an overpass. And um, so that's, you know, potential there uh, uh, just off Buchanan, um, uh, west of all the residences and just east of the bulb. Uh, the picture in the lower left, these are pictures that Todd took earlier, and the lower left is, uh, there's a, it's the place underneath the Buchanan overpass to get over the train tracks. And it's where you go if you want to go to Target from Buchanan, you kind of, or that area, the, the East Shore, whatever that, what that frontage road is called. Um, you have to kind of loop around, go through there, and, and then get up onto that frontage road. Um, so there's a few parking spaces there. Otherwise, there's no parking anywhere really near that. Um, here's just a few comments from the pros and cons from the various locations. And uh, these give us some factors to consider. Um, certainly for specific locations, but just in general for what people are looking for in dog parks. Um, some people thought that it was a concern to see a, a, consider a dog park in the middle of homes. Of course, all the ones we've seen so far are either directly across the street or right next to apartment buildings, you know, from homes. Um, very limited parking was a, something that people worry about parking. Um, some people, uh, the, the so many young children play there, that was a con that in a dog park, in an area that, that um, uh, maybe the, the conflicts, people were worried about conflicts maybe of uh, dogs and children if it's not a fenced area. Um, excellent multi-use space that works well for all kinds of dogs, so they look for that. Um, someone said, I don't want to sit around, my dog is my exercise machine, so I want to get around. Um, they worry about, this was at the bulb, poison oak. Um, people worry if there's no fence. Um, or sometimes they like it. If it's the bulb, they like having no fence. Um, if there's potential conflicts with people in closed areas, they wanted a fence. Um, some people were scared off, did not like dogs. That was a comment that some people wrote. Uh, some people didn't want a tall chain link fence. Some people wanted one that was higher than just hip high, like in the El Cerrito dog park. Um, they want safety was a consideration. Uh, close to any neighborhoods was something they were easy to get to. In other words, needs to be open all year. Um, in a place that was already, oh, that was, uh, they said, watch out, um, you know, noise can be an issue, so that's a factor. Um, someone said, uh, west of San Pablo Avenue, there's, there's not really much out there, desperately need of a fenced dog park. Um, Something else, uh, if it was felt isolated or unsafe, they, they, that was a concern. Um, if it's not near a neighborhood, then it's not easy to walk to, which we've seen feedback that that's something people value. Um, some people didn't like BART being disruptive. It could be disruptively loud. Um, I didn't put it here, but also people, if there's already a noisy thing like BART, then maybe having dogs there isn't a big deal, as big a deal as it would be otherwise. Um, some. If something was too narrow, maybe that wasn't good. Uh, plant management. Um, some people said oh, it's too, this the thing is too close to uh, Section B. Other people said, well, maybe something that's close to Section B might help ease the load, you know, so things could kind of cut either way. Um, so that's some of the feedback that we got, a snapshot of some of that. Um, we can post the full results. Um, and these are some things to consider. Of the amenities, some of the highest voted amenities include fencing of the right height, water spigot year-round availability, signage for rules, no excessive barking like that, uh, double gates, trees for shade, and aesthetics. Um, 
and then I added one slide at the last minute. This is breaking news, and uh, I'm going to go a little closer because I can't. Well, no, this is um, an item actually my, my mother pointed out to me. My, my daughter graduated from the middle school today, so we were there, and, and grandparents were there. And I told my mom what the project, what was on. Oh, she said, oh, yeah, there's this with the news. And, oh, yeah. So I checked it out. So it says dog parks, playgrounds, and a theater, California budget loader with earmarks. So this is from earlier this afternoon, around noon. It says budgets have traditionally included plenty of money, but Democrats and Republicans, you know, earmark this or that. It says law, 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 lawmakers will vote to spend $3 million on a dog park in Rancho Cucamonga. So we've been debating how much money for our things. And um, so this is another source of funding, I'm realizing, these earmarks. And so we need to, uh, we need to get into with Buffy Wicks and, uh, and Nancy Skinner. We got to get them on the ball here, right? Um, and then this is uh, the story that came out just an hour or two later that says the budget was passed. It says Republicans criticized it for the, this and that and the other thing, and it just says it's got it in 12 days. It goes to the governor's desk, and he does have line item veto, so maybe the $3 million dog park will go away, but I would encourage the city to pursue this full force. <laughs> um, and uh, that's, that's my part of the presentation. I just want to thank the Dog Park Subcommittee for this incredible work over so many, many months. Um, it's so thorough, and I had a chance to read the full report of the survey results and all of that as well, just as background. And it's um, very rich and I think illuminating on a number of things that we've wondered about. So thank you to all of you. Does anyone have any questions? I know this is an information only, so um, I just wanted to check in and see if any of the commissioners have questions that they would like to ask what are the next steps it sounds like the next steps are to come back after we read the full report to the next July meeting and be able to have a discussion about making a recommendation to yeah, council is that correct so. and I think Todd Brian and I are going to meet about pr providing you all with the report that could be the similar report that we send to council good though knowing what you know now to maybe just think about what you would like to see in terms of analysis or takeaways as we're figuring out how to write up this report? I had one question, which was, um, as I read through it, and I don't want to get into discussion, but as I read through it, it, it actually countered some of the things that I had initially thought based on previous meetings and conversations, which was great because it sort of simplified my thinking about it in some ways, but I did wonder about the possibility of making a recommendation for more than one location. So for example, um, if section B were one location where amenities were getting added and it was getting dog parkified, but perhaps a small dog park could be looked at a different location, is that within the purview of what we could be discussing next time in terms of our recommendation? And then a counter to that would be, or not a counter, but in addition to that would be um, understanding more about what funding options there are for dog parks in our current landscape. And also, I have no concept of the amenities like putting benches and doggy bags and water. Like, I don't know how much that costs, but getting some ballpark sense of what the enchilada, the whole enchilada looks like versus like, just to understand Rancho what's Cucamongo possible. Looks like. <laughs> With the whole what? Rancho Cucamongo. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. That, I, I do, I will say I go to these other, I've seen the other dog parks in action a lot. And so um, it's, it's exciting to imagine we might have something in our community that would have amenities. Um, yeah, I would, uh, so definitely multiple dog parks are, are a possibility. Um, pe the surveys, you know, people work very clear that something close nearby, people that, for example, in Section B said location was very important to them, and uh, of course that's in the northeast corner of town, and we were surveying people that go there, so, um, uh, so that would be, um, so having something that's sort of geographically more diverse would be um, something that could satisfy a lot of those uh, needs. It seems like our, our recommendation um, to the city council is going to be broadly about the future of dog parks in Albany um, and whether or not section B, what the future of section B is going to be, um, uh, whether or not additional locations um, uh, are needed and if so, where and with what amenities. Am I correct in my understanding that that's 
that's what we're going to be recommending? I think so, because I think we added an additional work plan item that if this were approved to go forward, then there'd be a different work plan item to actually plan out a dog park. So this is just the sort of gathering of the information to make a recommendation. And then there'd be a different work plan item to actually map out that plan of what that would be. So I think you're correct in your assessment of what we'd be recommending. And then as far as the report is concerned, is, is the intent for it to be kind of a collection and a summary of the public input so far? Or are you thinking about including other types of things in the report, such as conclusions or? We'll be making a recommendation. What's that? I believe we're making a recommendation that this commission will review, and then uh, it'll go to okay. council. Okay, so, the, so, the, so yeah. the subcommittee is going to make a recommendation in the report that we're going to correct. I, we're I, gonna re I'm respond. correct, am I not? <laughs> yeah, I think we, to simplify things, um, I think we should have a some yeah. an analytic an analysis and conclusions of what we found. And that comes to this body, and then we review it, and then that gets sent to, to council. So your, mm -hmm. your conclusion will be, what are we going to do about all this information? Section B. Section B. Yeah. And you will also have some sort of recommendation about whether or not additional dog parks are needed, and if so, where, and with what amenities. I, I like the way you phrase that. Something about, and if so, when. Yes, perfect. Okay. <laughs> exactly. OK, good. <laughs> Don't know yet. <laughs> Again, thank you all so much for this great work. And I think we have some public comments on the information, perhaps. Is anybody interested in commenting about the dog park? You can. You can come up to the podium and. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Janelle Gary. And um, just my only concern is the fencing. Um, I work in risk management and um, without naming any other cities, we've had cases where dogs were off on leeches and the bolts from the fencing caught one of the dogs. It was a massive, you know, injury, um, a lot of, um, you know, veterinarian fees. That's my only concern. If there's any way we can find an alternative to the fencing, um, I don't know what that would be, but just, you know, wanted to throw that out, that that could be something the commission would need to look into just to protect the safety of the animals when they're off the leash. Sorry, what, what you, happens? Yeah, sorry. Can you just clarify, was it a chain link fence or it was? It's the same type of fence that um, you put up in uh, one of the, I think it was Berkeley or one of the, and the dog was off his leash um, and, you know, just running around and one of the bolts or whatever the, the fencing, it as he ran, it caught his skin mm -hmm. and it punctured. Um, the side of the uh, dog. So it was two cases that um, I can recall this year that that's happened with two different cities with the same type of fencing. So okay. I guess that would be my only concern. If you move forward, just think about some of the risks to the animals to make sure that they're safe. So thank you for your comment. Is there any other needed discussion since I know we're going to talk about it next time or are we able or, or oh sorry I'm so sorry I, I wasn't sure what was happening there. So let me see if I can do this. Uh, okay you can hear me. Sam Freeman resident of Albany. Sam if you want to use the other mic that's right there also you just turn it on. Okay. Yeah. It should come out of that little holster. Hello. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand over here so we can all see each other. That's perfect. Um, Sam Freeman, resident of Albany. Some of you have seen me here before. Um, I would like to try and be a voice of reason, and I'm an engineer by profession. I try and evaluate things um, without prejudging them. I am sorry that nobody else is here. Uh, so I'm speaking for my little group. Um, I'm the noon hour group. 
Okay, I can't speak for the after hour, the five o'clock group. I can't speak for the morning group. I can speak to my little social group, which is the noon hour group. Um, it's a mix of people who bring d multiple dogs because that's their profession. It's a, big peop a group of individuals like myself that have a single dog. Um, and it's a, I started going there not because of the social nature, but to exercise my dog um, because I needed a fenced area. I had, uh, I've had several dogs. I've had a young dog that couldn't be off leash because in training, and I have an, an adopted dog which has no recall, zero. <laughs> um, a squirrel, my dog is gone. I, in, in, in summer, I go to Memorial Park, because it's close. I can walk there. My dog, my seven-year-old can't, gets too exhausted, so I can't walk home with her, so I have to drive. In the winter, I go to um, the Berkeley Park. So I've seen both in, active, in action. Um, one's wood chips and one's grass. They have, each have their pros and cons. Some people don't like wood chips because their dogs eat the wood chips. Some people don't like the grass because, as you know, it's hard to maintain. Um, so there's a, a pro and con to everything. I guess what I'm trying to, oh, and, and then size and location. I go to Memorial because it's the only fenced in area I can go to. I have no choice. So there are a lot of us that have no choice because there's no place else for us to go. It's a, excuse the language, schlep to go to Berkeley in the winter. There's no, there may not, not be any parking. It's, but I have to go there because Memorial's closed and it's the only fenced in park that is comfortable. So when you look at other locations for the park and other opportunities for the park, I think we've talked about this. If you put it in a residential area, there's going to be a certain number of people that are going to complain. They're not going to want it, period. So how do you decide what's the right path to choose in terms of the many versus the few. There are a lot of people using the dog park. They use it because they like it. It's clean, convenient. And there are a certain number of people around the dog park that just don't want it there. N never have, never will. How do you balance that? How do you balance that? Um, there are other locations on Albany, we've walked through them, that might have some pros and cons under the, under the bar tracks, along the path. I'm not adverse to them, as long as it's big enough for me to throw a ball, it's fenced, and it has amenities like a place to sit and a place to get water for the dog. I have to bring water for my dog. As long as there's some shade. It's hot as hell there in the summer in Memorial. There's no shade except with it in the one corner. So when, you, when you're looking at why do we go to a Memorial, I know I'm talking too long. Um, why do I go to a memorial. Well, you know, as I said, I, there aren't too many choices. I would go in the down by Gilman. I forget what that you call that area. At the bottom of the Alb Albany on. Um, Gill track. You were talking about the Gill track? No, no, no. No. Um, oh, the Dartmouth. Yeah, circle down at yeah. the bottom. Uh -huh. That's not a bad little spot. I mean, I walk there. Um, it's 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 Bart, but there are ha and their houses are further away. I'm not adverse to that. I am adverse to putting it at the bulb. There's foxtails. There's 
too many uncontrolled dogs there. It's not a pleasant place to go, especially if you can't take a dog off leash. The people who take dogs off leash, off leash they're happy as a clam. Um, but if you can't take a dog off leash, and there's a lot of activity down there. We went down there the other day. There's no parking. We couldn't find a place to park um, because there are professional dog workers there. It's a very active place in terms of people go, going there. Can't, can't go to the beach, can't take my dog off leash. What do I do? Where do I go? I, I'm talking, you know, myself, but there's a lot of us in this situation. Um, so if you find a solution, it, it needs to be balanced to some of us have no choice. People who have dogs that they can take off leash, they can go anywhere. People who don't have do dogs that they can let off leash have a limited number of places that they go. I occasionally go to Terrace Park because it's a few blocks from my house. I have to be very cautious about squirrels or cats. But I'm be content to go to Terrace Park. It's, it's a nice little park, has water, shade, it's wheelchair accessible so my wife can get in there. I'm just encouraging you to think open-minded and think um, about a balanced solution. I, 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 Shelley, knows, Shelley knows this, I hate the place under the freeway. It's noisy. It's just not a pleasant place. And I have to drive there. I mean, it's, and find parking. And there's no shade. Okay, with that, I know, I know you're getting bored. Okay, with that, I'll, I'll let my, I'll have said my piece. You can call me anyway. Thank you so much for your comments, both of you, for being here and staying till the, to, to, towards the end. Um, so I think, do we, I don't know that we need any other discussion this evening. We, we've kind of got our marching orders and we'll look for the report. Um, so I think with that, we'll move on to the final agenda item of the evening, which is the Terrace Park Playground surface change. Can we not do the agenda item and yeah. do it for next time? The only thing I'm concerned about is Gail's retirement. Is that affected by this five bar conversation? Uh, we have our five bar people on hold, so yeah. I don't know if you feel like it'll take a long time. I don't think it will take a long time, but I also am sensitive to the fact that it is almost 10 p.m. Five minutes. Here we go. <laughs> All right. Um, Terrace Park. So, Shelley, do you want to share the... Yes. We... You guys have the staff report. So, basically, the, uh, the proposal to, for you from staff, the recommendation is to convert the sand area. This is the park at uh, Terrace. Uh, the large park that is sand, and convert it to engineered wood fiber, which um, is what is used in all the other five to 12 playgrounds in Albany. Um, surfacing in playgrounds uh, ranges from a tot turf, which is very bouncy. You'll see those uh, a lot in our smaller, smaller kids' parks. Um, engineered fiber, uh, and then you'll see still some sand in some of the parks. Normally, the two preferred use because of the fall zone, if someone falls off of a playground piece of equipment, they want to fall on something that's more shock absorbent um, rather than probably what we fell on, which is cement or something, grass. Uh, and um, tot turf is the most expensive, extremely expensive, so most people go with the engineered wood fiber, which is Fibar is the brand name. Uh, Fibar's benefits are that it is a natural product. Um, it doesn't have any chemicals in it. It is, uh, has a correct uh, shock absorbent for up to nine feet for the fall zone, and it's ADA accessible. People usually confuse it with just mulch that you use in your yard, but it actually has a, a function to it. So we're proposing this for a few things. In order, if you remember back, to possibly put in a piece of playground equipment um, in the location that was the, sorry, um, where we had a big tree. This is the small playground that has taut turf and sand. This is the area right in here where there used to be a large uh, coast live oak tree um, of thinking of putting a piece in here um, like a tire swing. We would have to upgrade the surfacing um, to, it, to put that in. California uh, doesn't allow you to have sand in uh, areas where you're putting in new playground equipment. Um, and so if we were to move forward to that, we'd have to make a change anyways. 
because we're at a point, we had a, our inspection come up where we have to actually refill the sand levels, um, we're coming to you because it's also a big savings in, in maintenance cost. Uh, cost of sand replenishment is much more expensive than five bar, um, which we tend to do once a year in the other parks. Um, there's one other thing that um, has come up for a while if you've been to, this just shows you the entry of the tot turf for ADA. Um, oh, it's not showing. Um, is a picture of the walkway that runs along, right along here, um, where all the sand from the playground goes onto this walkway. And you'll see it over into the picnic area, but m most importantly, it's on this path. And that's one of our number one complaints, it's a very slippery path in that, that section. So um, eliminating sand in this area would also help this path side. Um, so mainly it's for cost. Secondly, it's a better surface for a future piece of equipment. Um, and we've sent out this information to the Terrace, the ter terrace Park neighbors through our e-notification and also sent out to neighbors that attend our park cleanups. And we had it as a topic of discussion um, at one of our galas before a park cleanup. Uh, people were in favor of the, the five bar. They also like sand, but also could see like, well, we still have a sand area at the, at the smaller playground. So, I did not receive any other comments besides that. Are there any questions about um, Fibar or anything? Can you describe what Fibar is? How is Fibar different from wood chips? It's, it's, uh, it's not the outside of the, uh, from what I can tell you, but um, is, it's actually the inside of the wood um, that is used. And it is... Uh, it's designed specifically for playground safety surfaces. I don't have the exact description of it, sorry. I left that piece back. But it is not wood chips, which is, I guess, in, is the outside of the wood, more on is the bark. Is it like Memorial Park? Memorial Park? Yes, it's exactly. So we like just check out Memorial Park if we want to see Oh yeah, outside. it's okay. so all of our five to 12, except for this one, have, have five bar in it. So Ocean View, Memorial Park. Um, and then, as I wrote in there, our younger kid playgrounds all have sand element, which I think is great to keep kid, younger kids like that sand element, so we wouldn't change um, that. The one really great improvement for uh, here is that it would uh, vastly improve ADA access to the whole area rather than just that little ramp that we showed uh, for the sand. Um, you talk about just the tire swing, but that, you know, the other part where the picture that you were just showing is taken from could also maybe support some of those, I don't know what they're called, the spinny things that kids like go crazy over. Um, so I guess I'm wondering if that's compatible with a five bar surface, because usually mm -hmm. when I see them, it's on that like rubberized material. Which yeah, in, in the main, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I guess it gave up, it's 10. Uh, the main part is the space there. So uh, when planning playground uh, equipment, there's a use zone. So only certain types of equipment will be allowed in there. But if that's spinny, oh, oh not that spinny, the metal run around. Not the metal run around, but the, the other one. single ones that people can sit on. Or sit oh, on. yeah. I can't remember. I don't know what those are called. Yeah. No, those are fine on spinners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they are called spinners. Then the other the single use ones. Yeah. The other question slash concern I have is the in the tot lot up there, the sand just gets so funky. Like it's full of rocks and sticks and other stuff, and that's actually a place where like I could see in the future wanting to change it to five bar as well. Um, and so. Je like my daughter, when she played, there were just rocks, and I didn't even want her to play in that sand, so I put her down when she was like a potted plant in the other one, um, the, the lower lot. But there's that corner of it over by the monkey bars that um, also is kind of an area that either, you know, it's just like if it were turned to five bar, I don't know how used it would be, but it can be used as sand. So is there a way to like section off that corner and keep it as like a little sandbox for mm. kids? Um, and not convert the whole mm -hmm. of the lower sand lot to it. I think that totally could be looked at, just like we've done at Memorial Park. Okay. That sand area is separate. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah, like Memorial that Park too. does have like Fibar and Tot Turf in its five to 12, but it has a separate sand. Yeah, because I do mm -hmm. feel like given the cost savings that you outlined mm -hmm. in this report, like I could definitely see potentially turning this into five bar at some point in the future as well, because like I said, the sand is just so funky. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's usually the complaint of sand. 
The funkiness that's in it, yes. It's less mm -hmm. funky in that lower <laughs> one, so there's a way to like preserve it, because you mm -hmm. see kids really playing in it, and yeah. so I think getting rid of it entirely would be a mistake, but that, so that's my one comment related to yeah. this. That's a good suggestion. Any other questions? Oh, sorry, yeah, I was a comment. Um, this, for the whole long list of our inspection, it is split between um, um, rec reserves and the um, public works maintenance, um, playground maintenance, for this laundry list. So that is has already been approved through council, um, the inspection costs, but this would be, in the long run, more of a cost savings. And then we would reuse the sand, because there's a large, large amount of sand in the other parks, so we would have to pay for the refill of the smaller uh, parks. Do we have any public comment on this? Oh. I want to allow for a discussion, if there's any discussion or a motion. I'm happy to move that we uh, approve the proposal um, of converting the sand to five bar in the lower playground area. Uh, were you saying we want to look into sectioning off some of the, the bottom? I mean, is that something we can add to our motion? Uh, I mean, we can add whatever we want, but... but uh, why don't we um, include that because we were going to have a second step in terms of discussing if another element would go in the larger playground. We could add that as the part okay. of that discussion. Okay. All right. So part yeah. of that. So at this yeah. point, we can approve the, the five bar proposal. Yeah. Uh, and then when we look at the other. Okay. Very good. Really? I, so I so Do moved. we have a second for that motion? I second it. Everyone in favor? Say aye. aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, great. Um, thank you, everyone. I know this is a long meeting. Are there any future agenda items just before we adjourn? Yeah, some of them came up. Um, Budget. Funding sources. Mm -hmm. So if we could hear a report on funding sources, like Prop 68, other things we may or may not know about. Um, also, creek maintenance, that came up. So if we could get a report on how uh, the city, on how, what the city does for the creeks and our education on our open spaces portion of our charge, um, and if there's any updates from ongoing Measure R things like the mountain bike park for uh, the mountain, the Memorial Park lighting project. Uh, with John I hear tonight, there's going to be a number of tree items, uh, so <laughs> to add to that list, but yeah. And then obviously the dog park recommendation conversation. Right. Thank you all. I think with that, we're adjourned.